Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The April 3rd meeting of the Anne Arundel County Board of Education will now come to order. Please stand for today's invocation. Oh God, we pray to administer that which is just in all educational policies. Being ever mindful of your guidance, stir us to action with love, wisdom, and understanding. The pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to this meeting of the Board of Education. This meeting is being televised live on AACPS TV and live streamed on the internet. General information and protocols for the meeting are posted on the sign by the doorway as you entered the room. So please make sure you read those if you have not already. Item 2.03 is approval of the minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Second. Any edits to the minutes? Seeing none, we'll just approve those by consensus. Thank you. Item 2.04 is establishing the, it got louder. You uh, turned me on. Oh, oh, you know what? Um, I'm so sorry. I did yeah. have, I did have a, kind of a major. Uh, for, for the minutes? Uh, oh, okay, please. Please. So, um, I, apologies again. So, under items of legislation, it said that I talked about House Bill 1399 and Senate Bill 1006. That's not true. It was Senate Bill 128 I was referencing. And so, that change needs to be made along with the um, description of what Senate Bill 128 is, was, et cetera. Yeah. That's sorry. I'm so sorry about that. Pretty good change. Okay. Yeah. All right, um, thank you. It looks like that, that will be, uh, be handled. Um, item 2.04 is establish agenda order. Would any member like to add anything to the agenda that's not currently printed? 
Seeing none, the agenda will stand as published. Item 2.05 is board recognitions. Yes, sir, if I may. <clears throat> April is the month of the military child, and today we're pleased to recognize the partnership that has helped us help thousands of military-connected children throughout every level of our school system. With us today are representatives from Fort Meade and Naval Support Activities, Annapolis. Also with us is Meade High School senior, Carrie Ann Smith. They're going to offer brief remarks in a minute, but I'd like to highlight just a few things about our work in this area. First, as we seek to elevate all students and eliminate all gaps, we need to recognize that the military-connected children are a unique population with unique needs. They face things other students do not, most notably frequent transitions between schools. Their ability to adapt, to, pre to present, and, uh, excuse me, to adapt to present and future changes deserves our respect and admiration. We are privileged to work on a regular basis with school liaisons from both the Army and the Navy as we seek to support these students. For example, Fort Meade continues to partner with the school system as well as the Department of Defense education activity to access grants and funding for programs that benefit not only military connected, but all AACPS students. MIDS for Kids continues to be the largest service project at the Naval Academy, with hundreds of midshipmen participating in our elementary and middle schools each semester and volunteer hours totaling in the thousands. Fort Meade Partners in Education program helps military units adopt an area school for a variety of volunteer opportunities. And this year, the NSA Annapolis Initiative focused on youth sponsorship and working with our student leaders in CRASC has just gotten off the ground. We are proud to partner with the Army and Navy on these and many other ventures. I will at now ask the representatives for both branches of the military to come forward now to say a few words, followed by carry on. After that, we'll take some time for a photo. Good morning, Board President Jillian, Vice President Urea, Board of Education members, and Dr. Arlotto. Thank you for recognizing April as a month of the military child in Anne Arundel County Public Schools. During this month, military families and installations around the world recognize the contributions of the children and youth who are at the heart of the military family and who, in their own ways, serve and sacrifice in support of the, their military parents and our country. Since most of those children attend our public schools, it is important that we continue to work together to support them and their families. This year, we, are proud, we were proud to partner the Chesapeake Regional Association of Student Councils for the Patriotic Partners event that was held at Severna Park High School. Bringing military connected and civilian students together is a great way to forge bonds that can last a lifetime. And we look forward to growing these partnerships and making them stronger each and every year. So as we celebrate and recognize our military connected children, we also appreciate the teachers and school administrators who work hand in hand with our families to help school transitions go as smoothly as possible. Working together, we can ensure that our children are both warmly received and challenged academically as they continue on their personal growth to greatness. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Anne Arundel County Public School Board for allowing me an opportunity to provide a few brief remarks this morning. For over 30 years, we have set aside time to recognize and honor the commitment, contributions, and sacrifices our military children make to the nation through the strength they provide soldiers and families. Of particular significance that I cannot overemphasize is the sacrifice. This is something we readily recognize regarding our veterans and service members, but is often overlooked among our military children. So allow me to put this in perspective. My oldest daughter is 21 years old. Because of the combat deployments and unaccompanied overseas assignments, I was away for over six years. Similarly, I have an 18-year-old daughter, and I've missed five years of her life. My oldest daughter has moved 10 times in 21 years. My 18-year-old has moved nine times. 
In other words, about every 24 months, my children were forced to leave schools, their friends, their home, and start the process all over again. Oftentimes, accepting new and greater responsibilities when, in this case, I was deployed. This is not unique to my family. It is indicative of a military child's way of life. As Garrison Commander of Fort George G. Meade, I'm proud to have seven Anne Arundel County Public Schools on my installation. Nearly 40% of the student population are military children whom, through their sacrifices, have learned resilience and bring with them a vast amount of life experience and perspectives. So as a father and a commander, I salute the Anne Arundel County Public School System for recognizing our military children, and I look forward to working with you to continue to improve the educational experience of our students on issues such as school choice and program choice. And I'd like to turn it over to Karen, one of Fort Meade's finest, that is very uh, indicative of the military child. Good morning, President Gilliland and Vice President Urea, Dr. Arlotto, and board members. I am proud to be here today as part of Month of the Military Child, speaking on behalf of Fort Meade military families and Meade High School. First, I would like to express my gratitude of having the opportunity to make an appearance among many important figures. As I continue to journey through life and write the full story of Kerryon Alexander Green Smith, I promise that I will not let my Fort Meade community down. The main challenge of being a military child, as experienced by me, were the constant and abrupt relocations. My most challenging relocation was my third and final one, sending my family from Virginia to Maryland. I was in the middle of my sixth grade year, and I adapted to the schooling in Virginia, and now I had to move. Everything would be new and unknown. Every challenge presents an opportunity, which is why I believe the joys of being a military student overshadow the challenges. For example, the constant relocations allow me to expand my network and introduce me to the beautiful Fort Meade community. It's not all about the challenges that are presented. A big part of our story is how we attack each challenge in order to overcome them. Overcoming the challenges were probably the hardest part of the experience, but after successfully overcoming each challenge, I became joyful and found myself in a position that I could have only dreamed of. Thank you. Thank you. I know we, we are going to come down for a photo at this time. Okay. do have a, a couple of, of board comments. Um, yeah. Actually, any other military families in the audience that would like to stand and be recognized at this time? 
making me look bad. I thought there'd be, <laughs> okay. Um, at this time, I, I uh, have a couple of uh, board members that would like to make a, a couple of comments. And, and first, I'd like to yield to U United States Naval Academy Class of 72, Mr. Live. Thank you, Mr. President. This is a tremendous day, recognizing the military child and the military families of Anne Arundel County. Uh, being a Naval Academy graduate and a retired Naval officer, you know, I believe I bring a little bit of a different perspective than most. Plus, add to the fact that in just a few short months, my daughter and her two sons, my grandsons, who are the sons of a United States Marine, will be moving back to the area. And so the compact of the military child takes on very, very personal uh, concerns in my family. And I'd like to congratulate the Colonel and the Captain for their contribution to our community. Uh, our service members, their families, are integral members of the Anne Arundel County community. They contribute to the quality of our life on a daily basis. And I don't think all of us can ever quite understand how deep and how broad that commitment is. Uh, if you recall, just our last meeting, we had Senator Barbara Mikulski here, and she reminded us that Fort George G. Meade is not only a sprawling military complex, as a matter of fact, I believe it is now the second largest Army fort by population in the country, but it's also a compassionate assignment post, recognizing the opportunities and the services that are provided by Anne Arundel County Public Schools in support of the children of our families in the military as they are deemed required some unique services. So I'm, I'm very proud to be part of this Board of Education, very proud to be part of our county that welcomes with open arms the families of the United States military. And I congratulate the CEO of Fort George G. Meade and the CEO of the Naval Support Activity for a job well done, and bravo Zulu, which means great job. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Leib. Now yield to uh, our Vice President, who's the daughter of a major in the United States Marine Corps, Mr. Rea. Thank you. So I'm a military child as well, and I just want to say thank you so much for mentioning Krask and the work we did with Fort Meade and NSA Annapolis. Krask and I have wanted to do that since I was in middle school because military children, being so close to the Naval Academy, as Mr. Leib said, are coming here and going here frequently. And I just want to say a quote that my mom told me a couple days ago, because, uh, long story, but um, she, she sent me a quote, um, and it said that military children would, will say goodbye or see you later to more people that they love by the age of 10 than more people will in their life. And I think that just signifies how much love that military children have for their family, their community, and just the world around them. And I think that really signifies what Anne Arundel County is doing, as long as NSA Annapolis and Fort Meade and Meade High School for our military children is trying to support them as they get ready and have to go through so many things that not every child has to. So I want to thank you all and thank you for coming out and speaking as a military child as well. So thank you. Thank you. And then another veteran of the United States Navy, Ms. Antwine. Thank you. As a veteran of the United States Navy, I will not make any Army jokes with the garrison commander here. But I want to commend you all for your service first and foremost, thank you. I want to commend the military wives and other spouses, and I certainly want to commend the students and the children of, of military service members. It is a family unit that is unique and like no other. Carrie on came here and talked about the positives and I thought that was very strong of him because there are some heavies that go along with being a military child, being uprooted from all you know suddenly for to accommodate the needs of a bigger mission. I appreciate his speech. I appreciate what the commanders had to share. I appreciate the principals and the teachers who make those adjustments even this semester when students have to transfer in, you help them to acclimate to a whole new world. 
I would request that the public understand that this is not an easy thing to do. And some of these mm -hmm. events are so traumatic that they affect these students for a lifetime, not just for a few years. So I thank you all for your strength, for your community involvement, and certainly thank you to the students who are making some big, big decisions and some heavy decisions, but they're invoking the positives as Carrie Ann has done. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Antwine. And again, thank you all for being here today. Uh, this time we'll move to item 2.06, which is Educator of the Month, Ms. Antwine. Me again. Um, today, today the Board of Education recognizes an educator in our school system who truly emulates a teacher's love for her job, her students, and her school. She has been a member of her school community for over 10 years and is so appreciated by teachers and staff, and she is loved by the families she serves. Maya Denson teaches fifth grade at Oakwood Elementary and one of her main roles is the math lead teacher for her school. In this role as math lead, she has been the champion of transforming math instruction at Oakwood. She communicates the initiatives of the elementary math office and works with staff to bring the newest components of math curriculum and instruction to life in the classrooms. She helps to identify needs within the staff and creates meaningful professional development opportunities to help math instruction continually improve and meets the needs of her students. Maya's classroom serves as a model for other teachers in creating rigorous instruction for all levels. In light of teachers tackling new curriculum and changing content, Maya always remains positive and works to be a problem solver for any challenge that may arise. She seeks out solutions and ideas rather than dwell on the challenges. She seeks to listen and support concerns, but also keeps the conversations moving forward and regards everyone with respect. And my pages are Outside of her classroom, Ms. Denson has coordinated and facilitated math family nights to promote positive math interactions for families and help them learn strategies and ideas to support their learners at home. Maya also serves as the chair of the science committee where she facilitates the science fair and was a key member in helping Oakwood receive the distinction of Maryland Green School. For the past several years, Maya has directed a free reading summer camp for students in the community, where under her guidance, students receive extra language arts instruction in the morning and experience the fun of summer camp in the afternoon. She volunteers her time to coordinate, plan, and execute the camp. She also works to run <laughs> fundraisers to provide students with free meals and snacks bus transportation, field trips, and provides numerous books for participating students. Her fundraising efforts ensure that the program remains entirely free for our students. Outside of her commitment to the program, Maya works as part of the Oakwood team to implement the extended day program where additional math and reading support are offered. Maya Denson you play a critical role in the academic achievement and success of the students of Oakwood Elementary. You, your perseverance does not go unnoticed and for these reasons and more, the board is honored to recognize you as Educator of the Month for April 2019. Congratulations, Maya. Please come up.
So what brought you here today? Um, they said I was getting a uh, photo for some math lead stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Item 2.07 is Employee of the Month, Mrs. Corkadell. Today we honor an employee in our school system whose colleagues refer to as their, quote, treasure. The school, Shadyside Elementary. The employee, the very one and only Ms. Donna Galloway, teacher's aide for special education. Ms. Galloway works with several students on an individual basis and although she has her own caseload, she is constantly providing support for all students in the classroom, always bringing out the best in all of them. As a former substitute at Shadyside, Donna was highly sought after and booked solid because teachers knew that she would run their class efficiently and challenge students to work their hardest when the teacher was absent. One teacher had this to say, some of my students' best work came when Miss Galloway was subbing because she encouraged them to work their hardest to, quote, try to surprise and impress their teacher when she came back. Donna is truly dedicated to Shadyside. She has volunteered during her own personal time to make a new student feel comfortable. She also assists in the after-school homework club and helps the neediest students to complete homework that may not be completed at home. Donna always fills in as a substitute on a minute's notice, with a smile, of course. She has a go-to attitude and will do whatever is needed. She always provides a warm and caring environment. Last summer, during a power outage, when students had to be kept on the bus for 90 minutes, Donna went from bus to bus in the pouring rain to relay messages, get students off the bus to use the restroom, and calm the nerves of many of our youngsters. Miss Galloway is creative in her approach in helping struggling students. Her goal? is to make sure that the students understand the content of what is being taught. She is bright, motivated, a quick learner, and has the ability to digest volumes of information. She is confidential with student information and always has their best interests at heart. Donna has demonstrated the ability to articulate information and ideas and still be encouraging with her words. She is always welcoming students as they arrive in the morning with a bright smile, an encouraging word, and a high five. Donna Galloway, you are an integral part of Shadyside Elementary School. Teachers always know that you can be counted on and that students will behave properly and learn in your presence. There is a mutual respect in the classroom that you demand, and students thrive when you are around. You have built relationships with so many students at Shadyside, even though you do not work directly with them in your job capacity. When a fifth grader, group of fifth graders were asked why they connect with you so well, their answer was, she just gets us. So on behalf of the Board of Education, the students, teachers, and staff at Shadyside, and all of Anne Arundel County Public Schools, we congratulate you on being selected. Employee of the Month for April 2019, please come up and be recognized. supposed to get an award. <laughs> <laughs> and who would you like to recognize this morning with you? My principal, Mr. Casey, is amazing. My spouse, Kathy, my soon-to-be daughter-in-law, and uh, our school counselor. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Item 2.08 is the Volunteer of the Month for April, Mrs. Hummer. 
A leader is someone who has a vision and can communicate that vision in such a way that others will follow. A volunteer is someone who contributes time, effort, and talent to meet a need. Combine the two and you have magic. Today we are here to celebrate the dedication of a magical volunteer. Ms. Danielle Moran, the Board of Education is thrilled to honor you as our April 2019 Volunteer of the Month. Ms. Moran wears a great many hats at Southern High School. She serves as PTSO president, created a PTSO Facebook page, created the communications committee, organizes faculty and staff luncheons, tidies up the concession stand to prepare for game days, and even co-chairs the Sports Booster Club. This is particularly re remarkable as she currently does not have a child playing a sport at the school. One of the most notable contributions Ms. Moran has made to the school is through her work as chair of the Prom Breakfast Committee. According to Assistant Principal Audra Whalen, Ms. Moran led a team of volunteers that transformed the school into a beach for a very successful prom breakfast. This was a year-long endeavor that included countless hours of planning and preparation. Students had a large variety of food options to choose from, and nearly everyone left with some sort of prize. Principal Fjordhard went on to explain, Ms. Moran organized all of this, reaching out to vendors, setting up, supervising the event, and cleaning up after the event. Students were amazed when they walked in the door, and they stayed until the very end. Words cannot express how much the Southern High School community benefits from this event. Ms. Moran takes her role as PTSO president very seriously. According to PTSO member Keontae Smith, Ms. Moran makes a point to promote teamwork among the parents, teachers, and students at Southern High. One example of this was noted by PTSO Vice President Valerie Bell, who said, Danielle recognized that our PTSO included our students, so she ensured that each class had a student representative and had them bring class reports to each PTSO meeting, reminding our students that they are valued. Keontae Smith summed up Ms. Moran's impact by saying, Danielle's uncanny ability to solve essentially every problem presented to her is a large part of the reason why the school's events are both successful and memorable. She is volunteering personified. Ms. Moran, you are a great asset to Southern High School and the entire Anne Arundel County Public Schools community, and we are truly grateful for your years of service as a volunteer and for your willingness to share your magic. Please come forward. With great appreciation, I'd like to present you with your Volunteer of the Month certificate and bell. very much. We have just a, a, a couple of quick items and then we're going to have a, a short recess for the photos momentarily. Uh, at this point, item 2.09 is school and community highlights. Mrs. Ellis. Uh, just a couple of things over the past couple of weeks. Uh, I had the opportunity to attend the Central Maryland Chamber of Commerce's Spirit of the Community Awards. It was a wonderful event held at the uh, Live Casino New Event Center, and um, several of our educators and support staff were honored there, as well as um, public safety personnel. It was a wonderful event. And uh, I, this past weekend, several of us were able to attend the, um, the convention of the um, National Boards of Education. and. We learned lots of great things. There were so many wonderful uh, sessions that I was able to get in depth in some uh, education issues that I'm really looking forward to working with our board, my fellow board members to, to bring about and talk about um, some best practices that are being done all over, all over the country. Thanks. Thank you. Mrs. Shaheim. 
Um, back on March 26th, I attended um, our County Executive Stuart Pittman's uh, District 5 budget hearing. It was incredibly well attended, um, I think probably the most attended of, of all of them, and uh, it was really lovely to hear that the, that the number one issue um, from constituents in, in my district was uh, is education issues and uh, and proper funding for that. So that was lovely, lovely to hear. And as uh, Ms. Ellis said, a, a bunch of us went to the NSBA conference um, last weekend in Philly. It was wonderful. The speakers were incredible and inspiring. And uh, it was a wonderful learning experience, um, I know for myself, and I'm, I'm fairly sure for everyone uh, who attended and I, I was glad to be a part of it and glad to um, looking forward to putting those things that I learned to, to use here so thank you thank you Miss Antwine thank you so I have not seen you all in a month and uh, I do not apologize for that I have been very involved in the community to include the recent budget hearings in District 1. I appreciate the opportunity and, and the flexibility of you all to allow me to do that. What came out of that is much of what Ms. Shalham shared. The community is strong about education and that helps. That helps tremendously. I also attended the Family Involvement Conference in District 1. That conference was so well coordinated. Most importantly, I got to meet moms and dads outside of a, a standard forum who, who were very transparent in the things that they needed for their children. And we learned from the uh, very dynamic speaker on solutions when uh, these things occur as parents. Um, the Family Involvement Conference also allowed us to share how we can best perform as families in a, in a school systems community to improve even when things are well established. So that was fun. Then the Spirit of Community Awards. I really want to commend all of the nom nominations and the winners. Just hearing that and knowing that people outside of our school system recognizes your hard work, I hope encourages you to keep doing what you do because it is working, it is positive, and it is needed. Finally, I attended a host of community forums in District 1. I thank you, first of all, for your confidence in me to share your concerns. I also thank you for allowing me to bring those things back to the board for positive action and positive solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Antoine. Mrs. Hummer. Um, yes, I'd, I'd love to visit schools and see our kids in action. And I was able to attend Monarch Global Academy and to um, listen in on some of their IB primary years program final presentations for sixth graders. It's an amazing opportunity where they um, identify a community issue and problem and research it and come up with possible solutions and then present it to a group. And it's a wonderful culminating event to see all the skills they've built up to that. We are very fortunate to have so many IB programs from elementary up to high school throughout our system. We, for those who don't know, we have more IB programs than any other school system in North America. So um, that was a great day. It is the time of year for musicals and plays at the schools and so um, I the West Side Story at Arundel High School was amazing if you who would have thought that those boys could dance like they danced and then I saw the Lion King Jr. at Hillsmere um, Elementary which was a fabulous production and they had a hyena who could do the hyena laugh that that was worth every minute of it just to hear this hyena boy um, <laughs> Um, I also attended the Family Involvement Conference with Ms. Antoine and Mr. Gilliland, and that was a great opportunity. Love seeing so many parents out um, getting involved and working to be better parents and support us in the school system and us supporting them. Um, Ms. Uray and I w um, went to Brightview Assisted Living in Severna Park and had a community um, meeting with the folks there and let me tell you they were up on things they had they asked you name a question and they asked it they knew what was going on in our schools and they were incredibly supportive and wanting to know what is happening and what is going on and what kind of programs we have so that was a great evening um, 
Then um, last week, I also attended Taste of Glen Burnie um, for, to at Glen Burnie High School celebrating their diversity week. They had um, over 30, over 20 something um, restaurants from the community with great food and a huge turnout of families and children there. So that was a great way to wrap up that week. And then I went to the NSBA conference with my other fellow board members, which is always a great way to enrich our knowledge and bring back some ideas. And also a great way for us to see that when we look at best practices, there are many things that we are ahead of the game on throughout the country. Um, and then there's always things we can learn to be even better. Um, I focused on attending um, sessions on equity and student mental health so that we could bring back, you know, looking at some other things going on throughout the country so that we could address those hot issues more um, in depth with our students. So um, it was a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Can you give us a sense of what that hyena laugh was like? I cannot um, at all. It is okay. not replicable. <laughs> but I mean, every time he did it, everybody, in, I mean, it, it, everybody went, whoa, you know, it was amazing. <laughs> Maybe we can invite him to a board meeting and do his hyena for us. Miss Urea. Is that a motion? Because I second that. But um, so yes, I also had the wonderful opportunity with Miss Hummer to attend Brightview Severna Park, where I actually work on the weekends. They were always like, "Oh, Josie, come on in." So I was like, "Okay." And so we got to talk with a bunch of residences about what the school system is doing. And a lot of them actually were fellow um, principals, fellow teachers that had retired and now live there. So they knew their stuff, as Ms. Hummer said, definitely. It was amazing. Um, and then I also had the wonderful opportunity to, um, last week on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I went to the Maryland Association of Student Councils Convention in Ocean City. So it was really cool networking with a bunch of student leaders from across Maryland, talking about current. Um, upcoming mental health issues. There was a guest speaker talking about uh, your power of student voice. And then I drove straight from there, straight to Philadelphia for the NSBA conference, um, which was wonderful. I also got to network with student members from across the nation. There weren't that many, but there was a couple. Um, and it was awesome, really getting to know what their school board's doing, um, knowing what their current topics are, and how they navigate being a student on the board. They're always like, whoa, you have voting rights? But yeah, and uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the sessions that I focused on were, um, there was this new happiness, I'm probably calling it something wrong, but happiness curriculum that is uh, started from the Harvard, and Dr. Olato explained how that's currently being looked into as well, and I thought that was really interesting with the orange frog. And then I also went to another um, session about overcoming the barriers of <laughs> check, <laughs> overcoming the barriers of, of poverty and how school systems across the nation that have high area of farm, um, farm students um, try to push them to still excel. So it was really neat. Thank you. Between hyenas and orange frogs, you never know what we're <laughs> going to talk about here. Um, item 2.10 is the superintendent's update. Dr. Arlotto. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. I just have one update. Um, for those, I think most of you know that 2020 is a census year, so you are soon to be counted. Um, and Anne Arundel County um, and our county executive and others had a press conference at the beginning of last week to announce this upcoming census. Um, and the work that's going on in the committee that will be doing that work, we're certainly going to play a large part in that in assisting the county in making sure that everybody is counted via the school system. With that, the county executive asked that one of our students design the logo for the 2020 census. You see that before you, and Joshua Ramirez, unfortunately, who was, um, wasn't able to be with us today, but Joshua Ramirez is a student at Old Mill High School, and his uh, design was picked uh, to be the logo for the Anne Arundel County 2020 Census. And there it is before you. Really very cool. So we're very proud of Josh. We're very proud to be part of the Census. Thank you. Is that? No, they just have to. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there a CAC? No CAC report today. So uh, we will take a, a short recess now for the photos, and then we'll come back with the presentation. Thank you.
to uh, reconvene uh, with item 2.12, which is presentation, Cultivating Communities of Wellness. Welcome. Thank you, welcome. Good morning, President Gilliland, Vice President Urea, Dr. Arlotto, and members of the board. For the record, my name is Jody Rissi, the Supervisor of Food and Nutrition Services. And I'm Christiana Walsh, Coordinator of Health, Physical Education, and Dance. With us today are staff and students from the Wellness Schools of Distinction, along with representation from the Maryland State Department of Education. Thank you for this opportunity to share our achievements and our successes over this past school year. You will hear from this team of individuals how we all came together with one goal in mind, to create healthy students, healthy schools, while we cultivate communities of wellness. On behalf of the Wellness Council, we thank you for this opportunity to share the work that we do and for allowing us to move forward to make a positive impact on the lives of students, staff, families, and the communities we serve. Before you is the Center for Disease Control's whole school, whole community, whole child model, representing the 10 components of a collaborative approach to learning and health. Not only is this model for the CDC, but it's the model adopted by Anne Arundel County Public Schools Wellness Council over 15 years ago. Since 2004, Anne Arundel County Public Schools aligns the 10 components from the CDC model with the membership of the Wellness Council. Along with monthly meetings, we also maintain a wellness toolkit which could be found on aacps.org. This resource is a one-stop shop to all wellness initiatives and activities, all within AACPS. It reaches our students, our staff, our families, and the communities, so be sure to check it out today. Next, I would like to introduce Megan Lopes. She's the staff specialist for the Maryland State Department of Education. Thank you, Jody. For the record, my name is Megan Lopes. I'm a staff specialist in the Office of School and Community Nutrition Programs at the Maryland State Department of Education. It is truly a pleasure to be here and present with AACPS's Wellness Council and School Wellness Leaders. The State Department of Education is part of the Maryland Wellness Policies and Practices Project. This project is a partnership with the University of Maryland Baltimore, Department of Health, and the University of Maryland Extension. The project focuses on providing local school systems support on the implementation and evaluation of their wellness policies. In 2018, we released the Maryland School Wellness Scorecard, a tool built from the CDC's School Health Index and other national organizations. The scorecard assesses wellness practices and helps schools identify areas for further implementation. You have a copy of the scorecard in front of you. Two school systems in Maryland have prioritized having all schools complete the scorecard during 18 and 19 school year. I'm happy to say AACPS is one of the school systems. So yes, there was a 100% completion rate. All schools have completed the scorecard. AACPS had two Wellness Council members meet with administrators at each school. I had the opportunity to join a visit to Botkin Elementary School. I was highly impressed with the dialogue that was taking place with Wellness Council members and local school administrators. By completing the assessment face-to-face -face with administrators, it allowed council members to help clarify questions about the wellness policy and regulations and, dis and discuss feasible best practices for implementation. The data from the scorecard has been compiled by AACPS and we're beginning to assess the results. I'd like to share two data points with you. The section of the scorecard titled Physical Activity Environment looks at physical activity breaks in the classroom and physical activity before and after school. 65% of schools assess themselves as having these practices fully and partially in place. The section of the scorecard titled Nutrition Guidelines, which looks at foods sold and made available to students, 61% of schools assess themselves as having these practices fully or partially in place. So with the results of this year's scorecard, AACPS has strong baseline data available to measure over time. 
The council plans to conduct the scorecard again during school year 2019 and 20 with all schools. Now I would like to introduce Lisa Rice, a principal at Ferndale Early Education Center. She's going to talk more about what wellness looks like in her school. Thank you, Megan. For the record, my name is Lisa Rice, principal at Ferndale Early Education Center. It is truly an honor to be here today to share how important wellness is to the students, staff, and the community of Ferndale. April is Healthy Anne Arundel Month, which provides the Wellness Council an excellent opportunity to discuss what is happening in our schools and communities. This year, Ferndale hosted the Wellness Council at our school. The students had the opportunity to not only present how they feel about wellness, but they engaged in discussion and activities surrounding wellness as demonstrated in the community circle. This strategy enhances community among students. Together they're building a community of confidence, which leads to trust. In the upcoming video, you're about to see one of our wellness partnerships with the University of Maryland Extension. Through this partnership, our students are learning how to plant, grow, tend, and harvest a garden. They also have the opportunity to sample fruits of their labor. It is my honor to share with you some of the students from Ferndale. We could go around in a circle and say names. Oh, tell people who you are? Yeah. yeah. So every single time you go, every single time you, go, every you, then it goes to her. fruits and vegetables. At lunch? At lunch time you get to eat different fruits and vegetables. When else do you get to eat fruits and vegetables? Um, at school. At school, yeah. What happens in your classroom each week? Um, do not share. You get to share. What kinds of foods have you had at school? Remember your stickers you get? What kinds of foods have you tried? Yogurt. You tried yogurt? No. No. Cheese. Cheese and yogurt? But what about the fruits and vegetables? What fruits and vegetables have you tried, Joey? Um, pumpkins. You tried pumpkins? Pumpkin seeds. You tried pumpkin seeds? Did you like the pumpkin seeds? Yeah? Joey, what's your favorite thing at Ferndale? Um, eat lunch, eat lunch. <laughs> That was really cute. Thank you, Lisa, for sharing your students' viewpoint on wellness, and I might actually steal that garden idea like any good teacher. <laughs> for the record, I am Kimberly Winterbottom, principal of Marley Middle School and a proud product of Anne Arundel County. I am super proud to be a graduate of Bodkin Elementary, Chesapeake Bay Middle School, and Chesapeake High School. The importance of staff wellness and how it contributes to an overall school culture, which ultimately impacts student achievement, cannot be overstated. At Marley Middle School, we implement physical activity events with parents, students, staff, and community. What you're looking at here is one of our teachers who has been trained in the Initiative and Confidence course at Arlington Echo. We utilize these activities from our trainings for students, engaging them in team building activities at the beginning of the year, and we even host events for our families using these activities as well. <clears throat> we also utilize them during a daily advisory and homeroom period. We get out and about in the community by attending monthly attendance walks. We visit the homes of multiple students who we have identified that need a visit from us. So we're out and about walking through the community and we also bring them tons of resources and activities for them to bring back into the school the next day to encourage them to come back and visit 
us. We connect with the families and provide the resources explaining the importance of attending school. We truly believe in the power of connecting with our families, and this is just one way that we impact our students by stepping outside of the school walls and visiting homes. We have multiple wellness-inspired initiatives. Each of our faculty meetings, healthy snacks and food options are provided to encourage healthy choices. Teachers participate in games as well they are, that they are expected to take back to their students to break up the monotony of the day. In addition, we support staff mental wellness by sending out monthly handwritten postcards to all of our staff members. These are some pictures from some of our staff wellness initiatives that we happen to participate in outside of the building. We had about 60 to 70 staff participate in a Navy game this year. We always go to an Orioles field trip. And these are pictures from some of our running events. And then we do some leadership and bowling events outside of the building as well. <clears throat> we take staff wellness to heart. When people enjoy their jobs and look forward to coming to work, they perform and feel much better, which ultimately impacts our students. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Patrick Gelinas. I'm the principal of Annapolis High School. Uh, with me this morning is Miss Mary Kay Connerton. She's our wellness coordinator. Uh, we also brought three Annapolis High School students with us. Uh, who better to talk about our wellness program than our students? So to my left is Jenna Wooster. She's our wellness club president. And off to the side are students Capri Savoy and Daniel Duran, who will join us in a uh, couple of minutes. While I'm, of course, beyond proud to say that Annapolis High School is a wellness school of distinction, uh, the true purpose of being here today is to share with you how wellness, mindfulness, and a focus on mental health uh, is present in all parts of our instructional program, not just for our students, but for our staff and for the families of our students as well. Our wellness program has four distinct pillars, uh, which are up on the screen, uh, wellness in the classroom, wellness in Richmond, employee wellness, and community wellness, and each of them aligns with the work of the AACPS Wellness Council. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask our wellness coordinator, Ms. Connerton, to share with you information regarding our wellness program and just a few of our wellness initiatives. Thank you so much, Mr. Gelinas. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Mr. Gelinas shared with you, our four distinct pillars um, enables us to have wellness be the web that ties us all together. Um, up on the screen, you will see monthly initiatives. These themes are guided from national wellness themes along with local needs in our community, and they basically are what steer our wellness program month to month. Um, in fact, this month is Think Local, Think Global, Act Local, um, and we're going to be offering offering different um, lessons within our advisory on the environment, on domestic violence, and on juuling and vaping. Um, our first pillar I'm going to talk about is wellness in the classroom. So this includes brain boost within all learning environments. So whether that means a distinct push-in um, conducted by myself or online streaming with videos or professional developments for teachers. Um, we're also proud to say that we are the first school to offer the first yoga and mindfulness PE elective called Stretcher Wellness in the county. Um, it is now offered in several high schools and um, Annapolis High is a model school for that. Our next pillar is wellness enrichment. So this includes wellness pullouts where students are strategically um, pulled to come and experience wellness strategies to assist with their learning and their personal and professional growth. We also provide self-care opportunities for our athletes. Um, we also have a plethora of wellness related clubs that students can choose from during Panther Hour. Lastly, we have community partner visits. Um, an example actually happens to be today at 1 o'clock. Caring Canines will be coming. Um, they provide us with five therapy dogs once a quarter to offer test anxiety relief. Our next pillar, employee wellness. Um, we too have a lot of stock that goes into employee wellness because we are proud to be employees of Annapolis High School and AACPS. Um, we offer monthly opportunities for employees to take part in self-care practices and to build community. So we have social outings, we'll have kickball games, we have weekly yoga classes. These are just some few uh, to name that tie in with this pillar. 
And lastly, we have community wellness. Um, as one of the leaders of our charter, which is called Connecting Communities, we reach out to the community to offer two at least wellness events per quarter, both on and off campus. Um, this month, we are going to be having Annapolis Runs for Love on the last Saturday of the month, Saturday, April 27th. Um, and this is going to be raising money to grow awareness for domestic <coughs> violence for the One Love Foundation and our local YWCA. Okay, thank you, Ms. Connerton. Uh, at this time, I'd love for Jenna Wooster uh, to uh, tell you a little bit more about some of our uh, artifacts that are taking place in our classrooms. All right, hello. Can you hear me? I cannot <laughs> tell if I'm close enough. Um, for the record, my name is Jenna Wooster. Um, I'm going to be demonstrating some of the artifacts in our chill stations. Our chill stations are small sections of the classroom dedicated to wellness. Um, these stations can have affirmations, calming oils, or items like this. A breathing stick is just a pipe cleaner and six beads um, to help calm and de-stress students. So with these sticks, you move one bead from each side to the other for each inhale and exhale. So it would be inhale to the side and exhale to the side. Um, by the end of the stick, you've taken three deep breaths. And even if you're not breathing, it's just a fun thing to fidget with. Um, <laughs> To pretty much close out my little section, I'm going to invite my fellow classmates, uh, Capri, class of 2019, and Daniel, class of 21, um, to lead us in different yoga exercises. I invite you guys to stand if you'd like to participate, but of course do so at your own leisure. <laughs> so we are going to be demonstrating tree pose and a modified triangle pose. So to start, they will root their right foot firmly into the ground. At your own pace, you can raise your left foot to the right ankle. If you feel comfortable, you can follow Capri as she raises her foot higher. So typically, you can keep your hands to your heart, like Daniel, or raise them up and out, like Capri. That's tree pose. So we will now be led in triangle pose, a modified version. So standing shoulder width apart, raise your right arm up and stretch over to the left for a lateral stretch. And now do the same thing on the other side. You guys have just done yoga. <laughs> so thank you to yoga, thank you to Daniel and Capri, as well as those of you who did participate. Thank you. Good job. So in closing, on behalf of the Wellness Council, we thank Dr. Olato for his continued support and Monique Jackson for her vision and leadership. It is evident that Anne Arundel County is not only leading the state, but the nation in wellness initiatives. We are truly hashtag better together. In, in health, health and wellness, wellness we, we thank you. Thank you uh, for that, Ms. Christie, and, and to the entire team, and, and Jenna, Capri, and Daniel, thank you for challenging us. Um, you know, I, I would just say, you know, you, you referenced the Shamrock Run. I know what happens at the end of the Shamrock Run, so <laughs> <laughs> that's wellness for me. Um, we, we, <laughs> we have a, a couple of uh, board lights. Um, <laughs> Mrs. Schalheim. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. I had the joy of participating in one of the Wellness Council <coughs> meetings at Annapolis High, and it was fabulous. And uh, I just, I love everything about what you're doing. I just have a couple questions about the report card and the statistics. And so um, help me understand about, the, there was a 65% on physical ac activity environment and 61 on nutrition guidelines. Um, do we know what things we we can we can work even harder on to to improve specifically sure i think i can answer that for you again for the record jody risty supervisor of food and nutrition services um the score guard the two pillars that are primary looked at are the nutrition guidelines and the physical activity um in the physical activity um you know we looked we weighed those before and after um school and how they were community enriched um that's something that we're looking at of having more families um I guess engage in a larger amount of elementary schools. And then for the nutrition education, the biggest thing that popped out when we did the scorecard is how do we embed the nutrition or the nutrition staff, so our servers, our managers, our cashiers in the um, kitchens, with the teachers in the classroom. So they're there for a very limited time. And that was something that we scored low on. 
But when we looked at it, we thought we really don't have our staff there all day. They're only there for three and a half hours or four hours. So that was something that we were definitely looking at on the nutrition side, um, along with when we uh, sample new items, when we're looking at new menu items, we often ask our students. They're the ones who, you know, they're having the, you know, we're keeping them fueled for learning. Um, one of the questions was, do you ask family and students about your menu? And we don't do as much with the family, so that's the other area we're going to be working on. Wonderful. And so every, just to be clear, so every school doesn't withhold for physical activity for punishment and every elementary school does at least 20 minutes and and those sorts of things we were really high on those what brought us yes. down was the the family engagement piece correct okay did, is there any school that doesn't prioritize the recess that if it's applicable or has any sort of policy on the books that withholds it as a punishment that we they, know about they do not but the question is was it before lunch so we think with the tool um, with the scorecard, and we've talked to MSDE about it as well as University of Maryland, we're going to do it a second year to really get that baseline data and see where it moves. But the question specifically says, is it held before lunch? Oh. So again, the questions were pretty specific, so we answered them exactly how the toolkit and the scorecard is labeled. So we believe we have so much more to do with the scorecard. We'll do it again, and then I'm sure in our true AACPS fashion, it'll probably be morphed into more of a collective CDC approach. Wonderful. We, um, Anne Arundel and Dorchester were the, the only two school systems that fully implemented it uh, during this 18-19 uh, school year. So we are learning um, some of what's worked and not worked. While we had LEAs review the assessment, we never did a lot of testing ahead of time with the tool. So we are learning sort of some of the kinks of what's what's been, what we may need to uh, clarify a little bit more in terms of the dialogue. Perfect. Is there a reasoning about the pre-lunch versus post-lunch with the physical activity? Is there is one better than the other in the eyes of MSD? Or? There are some. There are some. Um, Nationally, there's some things that have come out uh, about some of the best practices, you know, having uh, physical activity before lunch. But it's, again, there's a lot of factors to take into consideration with scheduling Absolutely. and all of that. So we recognize that um, at the state level. Perfect. Thank you all again so much. It was a wonderful presentation. And I'm really proud of what we do as a school system. Thank you. Ms. Antwine. Well, what has been demonstrated is how effective wellness is. It makes the day brighter, right? No matter how gloomy you are, bringing the wellness and the focus has helped tremendously. And thank you for this awesome presentation. Before I go into my questions, I wanted to commend you, Jody. All the way to Philadelphia, we were at our NSBA conferences. And while they were talking about food and nutrition, and vendors were talking about how they can make things better, we as Anne Arundel County were setting the stage. When they mentioned we do this, we do that, we do that. Oh, we already do that. And that's, that is commendable, so thank you for that. I want to also say in District 1, I had the opportunity to see wellness at work from the teachers to the students with our triple E programs and otherwise the community circles. I, I saw them in action and it made all the difference and it's throughout the day, which is awesome as well. I love the video, by the way. <laughs> But what I really appreciated about the wellness, which is so important to any wellness, is the self-pacing, the self-motivating, the self-decisions to get better within and outside of themselves, and the opportunities all, all the schools have allowed. My question is the 65% with uh, mandates for things like PE and, and um, when, at the high school level, the sports that come involved, uh, is, are those numbers considered when, when they're doing these assessments or these um, programs outside of those types of, of programs? So I think I can answer that. Um, physical activity in general, I think, is what they're looking at on this report card. Um, they do address physical, act physical education because that is a, a state mandate. Um, they ask about before and after school activities. I think when we talk about for, before and after school at the elementary level, it's more what is the school offering. When we get to middle school, it's about the, again, what the school is offering, whether it be girls on the run, boys on the run, hero boys. Um, and then at the high school, I think we, we look at it on a sports lens. Um, it doesn't call out athletics in the, in the scorecard. 
card. That might be something that we could address with um, with MSD as they move forward. But I think it's all encompassing of all of the types of physical activity we offer our students. Oh, thank you. And I was glad you clarified what brought the number down was the family involvement. But I, I have to say that we even announced today with Educator of the Month how the family involvement piece is very strong in our com in our county, mm -hmm. in our school system. So um, perhaps they're not assessing all of what we're doing, or I I'm trying to understand how they can give us a score of 65 with an excellent program. Yeah. I, I think the score is not representative of really what we do. So what we learned, and I know having Megan with us when we did so, two folks from the Wellness Council go out to each school. So we all interpret it a little bit differently, right? So I think moving forward, we're gonna have more scripted questions. Like if they ask us questions about nutrition and I'll just talk about nutrition, we do a tasting of the rainbow all the time. So obviously they have it. They're not even thinking to tell us that. So, I mean, as the first time doing it, we learned so much. We would go back to the Wellness Council meetings and everybody would be a buzz of what they learned and how we all looked at it with a different lens because we are representing all the different areas. So social and emotional looked at it maybe different than nutrition and physical education. So we are really proud of the 65%. And when you look at how many have it fully in place, it's a great number and it's really a great baseline for us to grow those areas. And I'm gonna look at that nutrition piece with family for me. I never asked the parents. But after this whole process, I'm like, you know, I'm gonna ask the parents, but I still need to make sure that the students are really the ones with the voice, because they're the ones that are having the lunch. Thank you. Great, there are no further board questions. Uh, so above all, uh, let me just say thank you uh, for, for this presentation. This has been a great presentation. I know there was a, an amazing amount of work that went into this, but then certainly it's the work that's done on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis that led us here. So thank you for that. Yeah, and thanks to our students. I appreciate you guys taking time out of your busy days to spend some time with us, to our principals and staff for making this a priority. Um, the partnership with, with um, uh, both the University of Maryland, Baltimore, and MSDE, so thank you for that. Jody and Christiana, you guys are wonderful, um, and leadership for Mrs. Jackson is just incomparable. So thank you for your continued work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next item is public comment. And um, as of a few moments ago, I still had no cards. So confirming no cards? Okay. Uh, we'll now move to departmental reports. Um, item 4.01 is safety and security report. Good morning, President Gilland, Vice President Urea, members of the Board of Education, and Dr. Arlotto. For the record, I am Monique Jackson, Deputy Superintendent for Student and School Support. I am providing the monthly update on security as requested. For your situational awareness, we have started working through the camera refresh utilizing the infusion of security funds from our former county executive. Specifically, the refresh will focus on the interior and exterior cameras to enhance the ability of school staff to utilize the point, tilt, and Zoom features. On March 27th, you received a link via the media coverage update with the WMAR story titled, The Journey of a Tip, How the New App is Preventing Tragedy in Maryland Schools, taking you through the journey of exactly what happens once a tip is received at the Maryland Center. The Maryland Center reports for the entire state of Maryland, tips since the October inception has been 304 total with 11 being for Anne Arundel County Public Schools. As of March the 1st, there were 19 reports to our Anne Arundel County Public Schools tip line. We continue, and I reiterate, we continue to get the most valuable information from building relationships with our students so that they can feel comfortable immediately sharing information with a staff member. And speaking of relationships, next month's update will highlight some of the partnerships that we have with Annapolis and Anne Arundel County Police. And in addition to that, what I have learned from my school visits and listening to teens at Teen Advisory. As we have said numerous times, student voice is so important to us. And as such, finally, Mr. Batten met with Crass to get their input on potential mass reunification procedures from the student perspective. 
Additionally, he continues to collaborate with stakeholders such as Fort Meade to ensure that there is consistent communication between all essential parties. Thank you, and that concludes the update, and I am now available to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Um, Ms. Antwine. Ms. Jackson, thank yes. you for taking those actions from last month yes. and bringing them back to us. I appreciate the demonstration as, as well as the information you shared. I have three questions, please. One, um, there have been some incidents in the last month outside of our, oh, on school grounds, but outside of the actual physical schools. With the camera refresh, how long will that take to, to look at those cameras and update them and bring them up to par? I will give you a better idea of how long that will take. It depends on the vendor. We are sort of at the vendor's mercy um, in this case because it's not work that we're doing ourselves. Um, but we will, I can get you an update, a periodic update on where we are. We started the work, and so I will give you periodic updates on how long that we expect for that to take. Yes, ma'am. And then the incidents that are happening, I, I wanted to be able to see if there was a pattern in some areas of our school system compared to others. Is it possible to get maybe a, a three to five year report of incidents that have occurred on school grounds that, that especially in terms of hate that we can identify and support for next, not right now, but at least for next month, a list of those incidents that have occurred? What I'm going to ask you to do, if you don't mind, ma'am, is to, cl um, to provide clarification of your question to Dr. Arlotto, and then so that we could give you the information, uh, you know, in your monthly meeting with him, so that we could give you the information that you're specifically seeking um, to make sure that, first of all, we do have possession of that information, um, and if we don't, um, to maybe point you in the right direction. Okay. So instead of looking down, I'll email you, Dr. Arlotto more information about what I'm requesting, and I would, I would appreciate, that, though we, we bring this back publicly, once I get the question there, please, next month. And then finally, the partnerships in Anne Arundel County, thank you for that. I think that's an excellent idea, especially with our budget coming uh, up at the county level. It's important to understand how we integrate and support uh, one another across the county. I, I understand that the police department is invited, is the fire department invited as well? Oh, no, I will just be giving an overview of um, what we're doing, um, how they um, interact with our schools oh, and some okay. of the programs. Yes, could, could we also expand that then to how we uh, interact with the fire department as well? Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Any further board questions or comments? Seeing none, any public comment? Seeing none. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Thank you all so much. Uh, item 4.02 is the bullying prevention report. Lighten it up. <laughs> Good morning, President Gilliland, Vice President Urea, members of the board, and Dr. Arlotta. For the record, I am Sally Egan, Assistant Superintendent for Student Support Services. I am joined this morning by Ms. Susan Love for the purpose of providing a monthly update on bullying as requested. As our strategic plan indicates, relationships are what matter to students. Students will share social challenges and possible bullying incidents with staff they know and trust. Counselors, administrators, teachers, and supporting services staff are an integral part of creating a safe environment where students can address concerns. A proactive approach to developing a safe environment and strategies for self-advocacy at the high school level are a school-wide focus on these issues. This report will be an overview of the highlights of efforts at the high school level. The school year starts with staff reviewing the bullying policy and the code of conduct lessons, which outline consequences for bullying behaviors. On a more positive note, systemic campaigns such as Unity Day, Kindness Awareness, Red Ribbon Week, See Your Strengths, Kindness Rocks, Gilson's Day of Silence, which emphasizes the importance of kindness, respect, and appreciation of diversity in our culture are held. Our One Love workshops are offered at a couple of schools that address unhealthy relationships and dating violence. Many high schools incorporate multi-tiered systems of support, such as PBIS, which is Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports, 
and restorative practices to reinforce positive behaviors. Several of our high schools have received training and are in the process of implementing these practices. There are many advisory lessons at the high school level that, co that cover bullying prevention, harassment, respect for differences, inclusion, and digital citizenship. Last week, actually two weeks ago now, Glen Burnie High School held a diversity week, which highlighted speakers and activities to further inform and educate students about the value of diversity. Our system continues to create authentic cultural experiences so that students embrace a diverse culture and show appropriate respect. Finally, in addition to the small groups that counselors hold on various social emotional topics, counselors may select to deliver lessons which include introduction to conflict, conflict style outcomes, different viewpoints, identifying bias and perspective, and steps for solving interpersonal conflict. The practices of AACPS counselors are consistent with the national school counseling mindset and behavioral standards. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. We have a, a couple of questions. Okay. Um, Ms. Antoine. Thank you, and thank you for the report. Mm -hmm. uh, expanding on that, last, uh, it's on my understanding at the last meeting, uh, a citizen brought to us a bullying report on Anne Arundel County. I wanted to understand uh, from you all how that report affects how we manage and operate here. What kind of weight does that, that report, for, I, I think it was a state report, how do, what kind of weight that carries in terms of how we're managing bullying within our, our school system? Um, okay. Good morning again, Monique Jackson. Um, I am not familiar, uh, I would need some more information on the bullying report you're referencing. Mm -hmm. um, could you, again, get that information to Dr. Arlotto and I could, we could give you a clearer definition or? I, I think you might be referring to the, the Anne Arundel County Council resolution. Didn't they create a resolution and they created a bullying report through the health department? So, I think that's what you're talking so, about. So uh, I received a bullying report that I understood came from the state about Anne Arundel County based on, and the resolution came from that report is what I understood. So I was trying to see if within, seeing that you guys are not familiar, I will forward this report that I received over to uh, Dr. Alotto, and the entire board received it, let me, let me clarify that. But I'll forward it to you, Dr. Alotto. I just want to know if from that report how we are responding to what was put out there. A lot of what was in there, you all have already presented to us. We just want, if there are gaps to be filled, we want to make sure we do that, and we want to continue leading the way in bullying prevention. Absolutely, and that is um, a good segue into what we've been doing, and that's why I have been going to the middle schools and working with Teen Advisory um, to make sure that there is no disconnect between what the data presents and what our students are actually saying. And so I've been um, doing half an hour to hour visits at middle schools um, across the county, and it was a um, superintendent's Teen Advisory agenda item last month so that I could get greater insight into what the data says vice what our students who are living it every single day um, not what they tell our parents because sometimes if you play the game of telephone it gets lost the first time you tell someone information it gets lost and so I wanted to hear it directly from the, the students yes ma'am thank you for thank that thank you okay mrs. Shawheim Thank you so much for your report. I really appreciate it. Um, I have a question about um, assemblies related to bullying prevention um, in in all schools. Are, I, I assume that they happen, right? And then do they happen equitably across the county? Does every school have, say, two a year or whatever the figure is? Um, when you say assembly, um, 
we I'm going to take that to mean gathering of students. Yes. So um, there are I would venture to say um, I don't have the data. I've not taken data on that, but I would venture to say most of our schools um, gather students in some format, um, whether it be in town halls like um, Savannah Park Middle School just did, small, um, intimate settings, depending upon the student population and the best needs. What we found over the years is sometimes an assembly of over 200 to 50 to 500 kids is not the best way to learn, just like you don't, um, I will quote, I don't remember who said this, but you don't gather kids in an auditorium to teach them math, right? right? And so we are going to um, work with our students in the mode that they learn best. And what we found, especially for middle school students, um, is that they learn best when they're among their peers um, in, in small settings. Um, so, and then to answer you the second part of your question, no, it's not equitable, and I wouldn't expect it to be equal um, because across the county because, again, we have tasked our principals to meet the unique needs of their school system. So what may be appropriate at Severna Park may not be appropriate at Southern High School, for example, um, and in the learning modality especially, and the content. Um, the issues are data driven and so we ask principals and their leadership teams and our um, Office of School Performance to take a look at their data, um, to take a look at their reports and see where, what grade level, for example. I was a middle school principal and I know that in September you have to meet with those sixth graders as soon as they come into your building. Um, and then you meet again with the eighth graders as they're exiting to high school um, to help them with their transition. Um, understood. Um, thank you for that. I um, and then what? How is crisis response and the crisis response team? How are they involved? Are they? Are, do they float around through all the schools to let schools know about their services? And and I hear that it's happening at some, but not others. I'm just curious. Yeah. So, are you talking? Speaking of the Anne Arundel County crisis team, yes, uh, yes they are. Act, they are wonderful partners with our school system, and um, they have made themselves available uh, by presenting at principals' meetings. They are part of Miss Egan's actually her expanded team, so they meet. Um, so. Whereas they may not have a um, forward role um, where people may identify them, a lot of their work is done in the background. Um, so have they touched all 100, over 100 plus schools? Probably not, but they are a really great partner in doing as much as we possibly can and indirectly helping provide professional development to our school-based staff. Okay, so they're, they're where am I headed with this? Um, say, say a population at a high school wanted them to um, be a, at a assembly or some sort of small group setting or whatever the the, the setting is. Um, is that is that decision down to the principal to say? Yeah, Usually it's that? the principal in collaboration with Ms. Egan so okay. that she can, um, as we've said before, our school-based professionals and we um, take great care in making sure and making those matches with schools, um, especially our school-based um, mental health professionals, and so they know better the needs of the school, mm -hmm. and so they're able to take the needs of the school with the services that are, are, are being provided. Perfect. Thank you Thank so much. You. Uh, Mrs. Ellis. <clears throat> Thank you so much for today's report. Uh, a couple questions. The I, I know you have walked us through the procedures um, probably multiple times now for when students have some sort of issue that they're concerned about. Um, it's my understanding um, there's a bullying report and there's an incident report. Am I correct about that? So, so there are the, two different things based on the concern? Um, so the bullying report, if there is a bullying uh, uh, incident that occurs, the incident report is more of an internal mechanism to use at the school level, not just for bullying, but it could range from, um, you know, something happened in a classroom that they need to. So the incident report is a school-based tool that's used to help administrators um, be, in whatever investigation that may occur, or sometimes it helps with our students who are verbal uh, learners that may want to write instead of, you know, speak it or um, 
in order to help them tell about something that's happened. So that's the purpose of an incident report that's used at the school level for a myriad of reasons. The bullying report is what is um, utilized for our school system. Um, and as I've stated, um, as you said on multiple occasions, that um, that report comes to several offices so that we can continue to work at the school level to help, as Ms. Schauheim um, sort of alluded to, that when there's a particular issue, maybe we need more staff development in a certain area, maybe we have a certain group of students. You know, again, speaking from the principal perspective, um, sometimes there are neighborhood issues that you may have to um, bring a group of students together to mm -hmm. work through. Um, sometimes, again, speaking from the principal perspective, um, something happens over the weekend on the sports field and kids bring that to school and so all of those things help us get the data so that we can act appropriately at the school level so <laughs> you kind of highlighted the reason for my line of questioning so I, I just want to take that a little further so a bullying report involves you it, it goes to um, the Board of Education to get to uh, for data purposes and to ensure that there's follow through and that it's being dealt with an incident report is internal correct correct so it stays at the school level yes ma'am so a student may um go to the office go to a staff member and say i felt threatened today in in my lunch period students surrounded me and i couldn't whatever like that would be an incident correct correct or it could be something as simple as um something happened in class i'm having a conflict with uh, a student in class again we'll go back to the sports example um you know i didn't make the goal and now they're making fun of me i need to write an incident right so that would be that. an incident yes. and then they and then they come back let's say a couple of days later complain against the same student is that is that student and is the staff trained in a way to identify when we're moving from an incident to a bullying situation absolutely because the person that handles it is the usually the grade level administrator the counselor or the principal okay and so you're you're confident that the aacps staff throughout the system have been trained in a way to identify when we're moving to a bullying situation and they will aid that student in filing that report I'm absolutely confident because I have conducted the training myself. okay great I, I'm just trying to <laughs> yes <laughs> create that pathway to absolutely that. okay thank you and then uh, one other question um, you mentioned the one love workshops and said they were happening in a couple of schools how is how has that been determined which schools and are will that be happening in all the high schools yeah. I will defer to Ms. Love <laughs> good morning um, those are determined by the principal and the leadership team at those the particular high schools I know that there is one at Annapolis High School and I know mr. Delanis had mentioned a little bit about the love one love workshop so there's a training that's involved and they partner with the one love foundation around um, domestic violence and dating violence so that's the one that I know of that's up and running in the fullest I was thinking there was a couple of other high schools that are looking into um, joining that and having that as an activity for students to participate and learn about so that's violence. driven by the principal and yes. initiated yes definitely most definitely okay. mostly students and again mm -hmm. it goes back to the data you know if we have a counselor that's seeing repeatedly over and over that this is an issue um, then they will definitely with the help of Ms. Love right. um, again um, we try not to have schools do things in isolation for that reason that you've pointed out, ma'am, um, that we want to make sure that things are consistent. And so um, they usually reach out to Ms. Love for and that. We've also partnered with the health coordinator with, around the One Love because we talk about the whole child and that was the wellness presentation. So we really work with other departments to coordinate that whole child wellness. Okay, great. I'm just, I, I just want to be careful that um, awareness doesn't always mean that there's not a need so if students in one Absolutely. particular school don't reach out doesn't mean that they wouldn't benefit from that so absolutely I want to make sure we okay thank, thank you. you thank you uh, mrs. Hummer I just have a quick follow-up when we were talking about billing reports versus incident reports if a child fills out an incident report at the school said they want to write it and the administrator reads it and says 
this looks to me like bullying. Does the administrator then submit a bullying report? Yes, it's usually immediately. Okay. Um, many of the bullying reports are actually submitted by the administrators okay. um, uh, because of the incident that you um, just described. So um, their determination from incident reports is they'll say this is one that if be handled this way, this one has escalated to a bullying situation, we will fill this out and pass this on to the next level and continue to address it here on the school level. Absolutely, and sometimes they reach out to those of us here at Central Office for assistance, such as Ms. Kathy Rockefeller, if there's something that's persistent that they need, and I know Ms. Egan's going to speak about that next month, um, if there are persistent issues that require perhaps a community circle, um, those are types of things that we utilize those resources for as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I want to piggyback on what um, Ms. Ellis was saying about just because students might not speak up doesn't mean that everyone couldn't benefit from stuff like the One Love um, presentation. And I wondered about the incident reports again. So they just stay in the school. Do they ever get reported back to you for data collection purposes? And if not, why not? Um, because, as I said, some of some of the things, uh, those things that are sometimes reported on incident reports are really the day-to-day -day operation of the school. Um, so sometimes, as a principal, things are going to come up that are just part of how you run a school. Sure. And so the major things, we have a major incident report. We have reporting mechanisms to report infractions of the code of student conduct. And so when there is an infraction of the code that occurs, those things are absolutely reported to us. Okay. Um, I can think of at least one instance where an incident report was filled out, but it was more like an infraction of the, of the, of the so I just want to make sure that when those things happen that they actually get, a, get addressed, you know, acts of hate, things of that nature, you know, um, so is there, would you all ever consider parsing out what is going to be reported back to central office and what, what isn't and be more definitive on where, the, where that line is? Um, we do that already um, through our training of principals. Our principals are very savvy um, and our assistant principals are very savvy when it comes to that. Now, is it 100% perfect? Absolutely not. And what I would encourage any member of the board or any member of the community is if they feel like something has not been handled at the school level, number one, reach out to the school principal. And if you have not um, received satisfaction with that, please make sure that you reach out to the regional assistant superintendent and that person can always um, follow up. And I'm in regular communication almost weekly um, with our regionals. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rea and then Ms. Ellis. I'm sorry, did you take, turn yours off? No, I okay. put my mic off. Um, thank you so much um, for all the work that you guys do. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, you mentioned like assemblies and them not being the best way to get students together um, by data. I was just wondering like what are the measures that you think are best to like deliver messages to students you said. Well, I'm just curious. What we found um, when we ask our students is they agree that being together um, but they feel that um, large assemblies and again I'm talking about the 500 you know, yeah. mm -hmm. number, right? <laughs> um, again when we talk about assemblies I think everyone has a different definition. Um, gathering of kids or students is one thing um, but a large assembly um, they believe is not intimate enough and they feel like they don't have the opportunity to really ask questions and to um, have interaction and so we're looking at ways to still gather our students together um, but at the same time for them the opportunity to have equity of voice so like advisories is what you're saying is a different gathering, but like smaller, more intimate? Yes, and okay. our um, students have been really truthful with me and they have given me ways to improve mm -hmm. advisory and um, oh. given me some ideas for lessons. And so okay. we're going to continue um, on that journey. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, one more brief question about the Absolutely. incident report. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say a, a parent is, is dissatisfied with the way an incident was handled and they're seeking to take it further, whatever that is. Do you have guidelines for the uh, in-school staff as far as maintaining of the incident reports and how is there a, 
a length of time that they're required to keep those records for investigative purposes? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. so that's established in the... Absolutely, and again, um, our principals have been educators. Um, they are teachers, uh, and they uh, have been... Um, have, they've been part of professional development every single month, at least twice per month, um, when some of these issues come up. And so, like I said um, uh, to a group of parents that I was speaking to, that sometimes we get the outliers that mm -hmm. something hasn't been handled appropriately. Um, but that is few and far between. Um, what we see most often is that children are thankful for the opportunity to be able to voice their issue. Right, and I, I, I see it going both ways because uh, if someone doesn't feel like something was handled properly, proper maintenance of, of those records can can indicate if things were handled properly. Right. And again, I will reiterate that if there's something that has not been handled properly, the best way, and I'll go back to um, uh, me being a Navy wife, is to handle things at the lowest level possible. Mm -hmm. And so I would encourage anyone who um, is seeking assistance to start with the school principal um, and then work their way up through the chain. Um, and that is outlined through our complaint process in our um, parent handbook. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Mrs. Hummer. One other, another clarifying question for you about the bullying versus the incident report. Yes, so I had asked specifically about if it a child fills out an incident report, or anyone does, and the school system and the administrators determine it was bullying, then a bullying report is filled out immediately along with, the, you know, to the next step after the thing. So same thing if a child comes in and or a teacher and fills out an incident report, if when the administrator looks at it and determines that there's been an infraction of the student code of conduct, then that is then escalated beyond the incident report, correct? Yes, ma'am. So it becomes so, an office referral or even to some extent a, minor, a major incident report. So it's kind of, so it wouldn't remain as just an incident report. Correct. It would be handled, each one's handled differently to see what it may be and what the proper course of action then is to follow afterwards. Correct. And one thing that we say in training is the incident report initiates the action. And so it's simply what what we use to initiate the action. Okay. Um, it's not the end all be all, but it gives, um, it's one means of giving um, the administrator or the school based staff the information that they need the who, what, when, why, where, and how. And usually that's what's listed on the incident report so that our students can. And then they can go on from there. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Porkinoff. I just wanted to. Thank you guys for the thorough, thoroughness of reports and just share personally that when my one of my children um, had a bullying incident that not only was the reporting and the process handled very well, but also that interaction and those one on one communications between the parents collaboratively, the bus driver, everybody, the response was to me beyond adequate and um, <clears throat> is definitely noteworthy that to see that in action. Um, is definitely a lot different than looking at it on paper <laughs> um, and definitely to the benefit. So I thank you guys for your continued efforts in that. Thank you. I see no further lights except you know, when you came up for your encore presentation, um, you said that um, we should not be teaching math in assemblies. And, and I'm hoping when you get a chance, if you could talk to some of our institutions of higher ed, you know, for freshman statistics, um, 250 in a class isn't working. Thank um, you, sir. Uh, I will take that on. Thank you. Uh, is there any public comment? Seeing none, okay, we will move to item 4.03, diversity and inclusion. Dr. Gilliland. Good morning, President Gilliland and Vice President Urea, Dr. Arlato, and members of the board. For the record, I am Maisha Gillens, Executive Director of Equity and Accelerated Student Achievement. I am providing the monthly update on diversity and inclusion. Today, I bring the board some exciting news. The National School Boards Association and its flagship magazine, the American School Board Journal, has awarded Anne Arundel County Public Schools its second consecutive Magna Award, a national honor given to just 18 schools across the nation this year. 
for the past two years. For the past two years, the Magna Award has recognized school districts and their leaders for their efforts to bring educational equity to their students. I am extremely proud to tell you that this is the second consecutive year we have earned the award and that we are the only school system with more than 20,000 students to be honored in each of the last two years. This school year, the Equity Lead Program was recognized. I must give credit to my predecessors who began the program in 2008 and to my coworkers, my colleagues, the board and the community for the roles they have played in making the Equity Lead Program what it is today. The duties and responsibility of the equity lead are to deliver the district-wide professional development during the designated early dismissal days with the goal of addressing the achievement gap. My office has been deliberate about building the capacity of equity leads. We offer quarterly research-based professional development facilitated by members in my staff. We also reinforce equity lead trainings at monthly leveled principal meetings. There is a lot for us to do as we continue our quest to elevate our st all students and eliminate all gaps. But we are very pleased that our work has been recognized at the national, on the national stage. Secondly, I am following up on the question raised last month regarding our partnership with PFLAG, a group which is committed to advancing equality through its mission of support, education, and advocacy. I have been invited to attend a PFLAG parent support group meeting, and I'm waiting for a list of topics they would like for me to discuss. I am very much looking forward to that opportunity. During the January level principal meetings, my office did partner with the Office of Student Services to discuss guidance on supporting gender nonconforming students. My office has also been intentional in our efforts to assist schools in eliminating the achievement gaps. Our assistance ranges from partnering with other offices and attending school-based leadership team meetings where discipline and academic data is shared by student group and problem-solving protocols are used to address those student needs. Our assistance also includes hearing from students across the county about their school experience, which in turn informs how school teams can better support students who feel marginalized. Mrs. Jackson and I, we have the unique opportunity to meet regularly with school community advocates with regard to closing the achievement gap. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Gillens. Uh, Ms. Antwine. Dr. Gillens, thank you. As always, I appreciate you acting um, in the manner that you do and the team that you work with. You, you, take, you get in front of potential issues, and I really appreciate that. My question is extended from the safety and security question, though. Uh, this past month, we had an, uh, another incident where intimidation and safety and um, diversity and inclusion all were compromised. And I, I'm, I would like to be able to see how we're doing that. I understand how we react to it. I would like to be able to see the reports so that we can build mitigations of, like the ones that you all have discussed today. So um, I understand that you want me to go to Dr. Alato with that, but I want you guys to be aware that I will be looking for that report in those areas, in diversity and inclusion, in safety and security, as, as well as the bullying because of the intimidation that it, it involves. And I'm looking at a five-year because it allows us to see patterns, right? And it allows us to think about what we're doing and how we can improve upon whatever we're doing. I also want to emphasize, I've heard a lot today uh, about accountability. 
I want to emphasize that Anne Arundel County is superb in its accountability in these areas. But as anything, we can always improve. So long as there are, as there are incidents like what we're experiencing, then what that tells us there is somewhere we can improve. And that's all I'm requesting. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Gillis. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Corkadal. Thank you once again for another wonderful report this month. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to bring back uh, accolades from the national conference that we just attended this past weekend. Um, I actually was approached um, after attending, you know, session. You get to know who, where you're from. When I said I was from Anne Arundel County, not once, not twice, but three times. <laughs> um, so I'll just share with you the states that wanted to extend to the staff a, a shout out of congratulations for the Magna Award. And that is, um, as crazy as it is, uh, South Dakota. Um, <clears throat> and uh, as well as uh, Georgia and Arizona. So um, I, I just want to also say that because uh, oftentimes you hear about awards that you win and you think it just kind of stays in the local newsletter here and maybe a little blurb in the local newspaper, but I just wanted you to know that, that yes, people do pay attention and they're all looking at us um, as the leaders and models. So I want to thank you guys personally too for making us look so good <laughs> because it was definitely your hard work and I want to make sure that you that those type of recognitions are extended to yourselves. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Hummer, and then uh, Mrs. Schalheim. Yes, I want to do a shout out again to the team for a magnificent job on our second Magna Award in a row. Um, as um, Ms. G Dr. Gillen said, we're the only school system, mm -hmm. large school system, to win two years in a row, and we're the only school system in Maryland that has won a Magna Award at all, much less twice in the past 10 years. So um, we're really standing out. It's a true example of how. We're being proactive and pioneering in our different programs and really becoming a national example. And it's not to say we're where we want to be, but it definitely shows we're making great strides. I know um, when all of us were meeting together in SBA this weekend, Dr. Arlotto shared that he went to a session on equity that a school system was putting on. And what he found out was that they were just beginning to talk about equity. And so when he talked to them, he was like, what kind of training are you doing for our staff where we have the extensive equity liaisons? And he said, oh, we're not there yet. And so this was, that shows how far we are down along the road. Still ways to go, but we are definitely um, you know, being really setting st setting a, an example for other um, school systems, and so great job to all of you for that. Thank you, Mrs. Shawhai. I just wanted to say thank you for the wonderful work that you and your team do every day, and it doesn't go unnoticed. And I'm very, very um, grateful. I know our students benefit from it, all of our students, and um, and I'm just. Uh, Really happy about the award, the two years in a row, that's wonderful, and keep up the fine work that you all do, and um, I'm really, really appreciative of all that good work, thanks. Thank you. If I could, if I could also add, um, uh, if, if you have not noticed, I'm speaking to the members of the board, and you get your National School Board Journal, and this month with the um, recognition of the wonderful Magna Award and the work of, of Dr. Gillens and her team and our, and our um, equity leads, if you have read through all of the articles, the article at the back of the magazine talks about creating good kids. And it's just a reporter that wrote an article and interviewed different people, and they actually talk about Anne Arundel County, Gina Davenport, Arundel High School, and the coordination of the citizen, Global Citizenship course. And it's just sort of an off comment um, about another school system developing another program, and we are mentioned in that same magazine. So if you have not read that article, please make sure you flip to the back of the of the of the journal. Fantastic. Thank you. Well done. We have got one more question from Mrs. Hummer. I just want to say that now they they have not announced what the topic will be for the Magna Awards for next year yet. It's been equity the past two years in a row. I'm hopeful it'll be equity again because I plan for us to win the grand prize next year with our global <laughs> community <laughs> citizenship with class. So today. no pressure, <laughs> no but pressure. I really I, I want us to put that in there because I know we're hearing from people all around that that is something they want to emulate. And so 
grand prize is ours next year. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, seeing no further board comments, is there any public comment? Seeing none, we'll now move to item 4.04, .04, which is the transportation report. We're going to create history. You run in the meeting. Good afternoon, uh, Alex Chaknova, Chief Operating Officer here to present uh, item 4.04, .04, which is a information item uh, regarding transportation. Uh, several meetings ago, we had a member of uh, the public come in and provide a school uh, board with some information regarding uh, arrival times of some of our buses at schools, in particular, uh, how soon prior to the uh, first bell some of our buses are arriving at our schools. Uh, one of the uh, schools in particular that was called out was North County High School, and the question was posed, uh, why do the buses arrive there earlier than at some of our other schools? Uh, the board asked us to take a look at it to see if we can come up with some solutions, so we're here today to present some of these uh, solutions. We've identified three of them, and if I can ask Ms. Howe to put up the graphics. So for those of you who are familiar with North County High School, you only have a single ingress egress point. And I'll be referring to the uh, board behind you there without risking blinding anybody. I've got a little bit of a laser pointer, but for those of you who are familiar, right here on uh, East First Avenue is the only way into the school currently. Uh, it's a signalized intersection. It's a four-way stop. Uh, Mr. Gilliland, I know you're intimately familiar with the area. It, it literally can take as much as half an hour some mornings to come down to Big Hill and make your way into the school right there. Um, so we took a look at what options could we use to eliminate that choke point um, and provide uh, enhance ingress and egress into the school in some way, and we've come up with three options. So before you is the very first option. Uh, we call that the East First Avenue option. Uh, it, the pros are it is, in fact, the most direct route. It has the least environmental impacts, and it does provide ingress and egress from that signalized uh, intersection. It does have some cons, however. Uh, we would either through acquisition or by condemnation. There are two occupied structures and seven resi uh, residential lots that we would have to either purchase or condemn. Uh, we did look at the other side of the road. There's three occupied houses and nine lots on the other side, so it would be cheaper to, to come on the southeast side of it. Um, we would have to work with, um, in addition to that, the buses and cars do continue to have that shared improved access going up that hill uh, up East First Avenue. The cost to accomplish option one, um, the land and structure acquisition cost, would be on the order of one to one and a half million dollars, and it would be about a million dollars of construction costs. So for about two to two and a half million dollars, we could have our buses arrive at that school maybe 10 or 15 minutes later than they currently do. That would buy about 10 minutes of time. The second option Ms. Howe will bring up, uh, we're calling the future Burlwood Road option. So if Burwood Road is a paper road that was never constructed. Uh, the county actually uh, continues to possess that as a right-of-way. We looked at bringing buses in and out of Burwood Road or provide us a second entrance into the school. For those of you that are familiar with North County High School, the area behind mm -hmm. right there where the green pointer is, that is the bus loop. The area in front is where the faculty staff park and where students uh, park as well. The area to the front and there to the side of the stadium. So the pros of coming in off Burwood Road uh, certainly would allow for a second entrance way. It would allow us to utilize the existing paper road, that's Burwood Road. Um, it crosses the right-of-way, the BG&E right-of-way, uh, with the least amount of impact. Uh, and it, again, provides us with an opportunity of potentially having a separate bus uh, access and not having to co-mingle the buses and the um, the regular cars, be they student or faculty. There are some cons potentially to it. Uh, this intersection doesn't exist, so it's non-signalized at the moment. We didn't factor in the cost of doing that or traffic warrant study, so a con at the moment would be a non-signalized intersection. Uh, we would have to work with the county and BG&E to gain access or purchase access on the right-of-way. 
at both BG&E and the county. Uh, we would have to do two private land acquisitions. Uh, this piece of land right here is privately owned, as well as this triangular shaped piece of land right there is privately owned or not in the public domain. We would have to either uh, negotiate the acquisition or go through a uh, public governmental taking, condemnation action on those. There are some significant steep slopes. For those of you familiar with North County, where my pointer is, there's about a 40 to 50 foot hill there. We would have to come through that hill, create uh, large retaining walls to allow a roadway to be constructed through that hill. Um, that's a significant steep slopes. We would clear the forested areas for the roadway. You'll see again, that's, that's a tree, so we'd have to take those trees out in that area. There's Cabin John's Branch River. There's a, an active stream with tributaries that run down uh, through the right of way, so there would be an impact to Cabin Branch Stream and any other presently unknown environmental impacts. Uh, we would estimate that it would be about $500,000 in land acquisition costs and about $3 million in hard construction costs for, for about $3.5 million. We could create a solution that, again, would have the buses get there about 10 to 15 minutes later than they presently do. Uh, the final option, the third option, is taking advantage of the BGE right away. That's a high transmission uh, right away, right there. Uh, the BGE has, if you're familiar, it's got large uh, electric uh, structures on it and high tension wires to go across there. Uh, the pros of the BGE right away option would be would follow the existing BGE right away uh, again and provide once, uh, as previously mentioned, a potential separate entrance and exit for buses only that would go directly to the bus loop. Uh, the cons are we remain at a non-signalized intersection. There is not currently any traffic signal control, and we didn't either analyze the feasibility or the costs associated with that. Um, there is conflicts with the overhead power lines and the BGE e structures that carry those overhead lines. Uh, we would have to work with BGE e to acquire uh, and pay for access to their right-of-way if they would so grant it. Uh, we would have to either acquire or condemn uh, through a public taking the land across that private property owner there. Um, there are those existing steep slope conditions I mentioned. There's about a 40-foot hill that we'd have to uh, carve our way through to create that roadbed to connect the bus lot to, uh, to the BGE e right-of-way. We would clear for us and, again, any other potential uh, environmental conditions that we've not yet fully assessed. Um, the cost of that would be, again, about $500,000 on the land acquisition side and slightly less than the prior option, about $2.5 So for about $3 million, we could probably execute this plan uh, and, again, probably gain about 10 or 15 minutes uh, in terms of uh, bus efficiencies accessing North County. And with that, uh, conclude my report, and I'll entertain any questions that the board might have. Thank you. If, if I may, just uh, one clarifying question, um, just for the record. The no local Board of Education has eminent domain authority. I just want to get that on the record. Yes, sir. That's why I said it would be governmental. It would have to either, it would, we would have to either conjoin the county uh, or the state to be our agent in the condemnation proceedings. Okay. I just don't want, you know, on option one, those property owners calling us today going, hey, you know, so uh, that, that's that's why I was uh, just mentioning that. Right. We, we've got a, a couple of questions. Um, uh, Ms. Antoine. Thank you for that report. Um, so me being a wee bit familiar with the North County area, I was also looking at the elementary school that is right there as well that has some of the same transportation concerns, not only with the buses and the busing, but the, the drop off, the exit and otherwise. Mm -hmm. Was there a reason we were not considering building an access road that allows the buses to just have a centralized depot between the, two, the schools? Well, those are the athletic facilities. The, the first of the options that would come up East First Avenue uh, would, in fact, provide some enhanced access <laughs> to the elementary school um, because you would have two ways into the school. You could peel off and make a right heading into the elementary school this way, and the rest of the traffic would go up there. The times of those two schools don't overlap, though, so it's not as significant an issue. You have far less uh, faculty and um, certainly no student drivers accessing the elementary school. 
But but again, the the issue is getting into the property, not navigating your way around once you're you're on the property. We could certainly look at other enhanced circulation issues, but the task that was assigned to us was to see how we could get the buses to the facility um, sooner than we we can today. I, so I that's, understand. That's what I we understand tackled. that. And the, the, unfortunately, I wasn't here to add on to that. Mm -hmm. But knowing that if we if we try to alleviate some of the pressures that are going for the high school the congestion is also right there if we could kind of kill two birds with one stone i was trying to see if there was considerations for that and how you know fiscally that would affect what we're what we're recommending happens at this time right again we didn't analyze that the 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 project that was given us was ingress and egress not circulation once we're on the site Okay, thank you. Mr. Shaheim. Um, thank you for that. Um, excuse me for my confusion, but on the minutes and, and memory also serves that we were also supposed to talk about the full RFP to discuss the transportation consultant, the item to be back on the board agenda for April 3rd. I'm not seeing it. I'm wondering why it's not there and why we're not talking about it because that was definitely mentioned as all of us will remember from two weeks ago. So when, when exactly is that conversation occurring so we can get moving on it? The longer we wait, the longer it takes for this to get rolled out, the longer it takes to get to hire someone, the longer it takes to get some solutions that we all desire. I guess the question's to me. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, I, I think we can discuss it now. I, um, I will say it. I, it fell off? Okay. Yeah. Well, that, then let's go ahead and discuss it because, um, you know, that, that was, that was as it states in the minutes and as my memory serves, that's all, that's what we wanted to do, bring the full RFP back to the board for discussion on April 3rd um, and to discuss timelines. So should we get into that then? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Can, can, would, you, would you be okay if we close out the North County High School issue momentarily and then sort of uh, segue? And, and I, I'm sorry for, for the... Um, for the drop, um, yeah, Miss Antoine. On, so, on. so my question is general. Uh, it concerns the constructions and when those bus sites change in, in terms of construction. For example, over um, over at North County and and back over at Mead, construction has been pretty heavy. When the, the constructions when the construction site moves to stops temporarily. Do those stops change again after the uh, the construction uh, is no longer an issue? Right. So uh, we're hopeful that anytime there's construction, we're hoping the duration of that is as brief as possible. We obviously have to adjust during that interval, but the intention is always to bring the stops back uh, to the original locations and back to the original times um, as soon as practicable once the it's safe to do so, and once the construction activities don't impact that stop location any longer. And so, like in this case, let's say the construction started in January, and we're moving closer to springtime uh, now, and the construction stops in April. So, uh, on average, how long does it take to go back to that normal stop? Again, we would assess that. Uh, we would communicate that. We would assess the you know, the, the viability of it, and right, then we would right. communicate that to the families. Um, by the time you get really close to the end of the year, it may, you know, the, the benefits of doing it for changing things for, for just a very short uh, period of days or weeks may not be uh, fruitful. So that's a little bit of a, a value judgment. But one thing we're always cautioned about is we always talk about, we always talk to the constructors or the managers because uh, you'll see lulls in construction activity right, right. and then they'll start anew or there may be a I second was, phase right, in, right, right. in between that phases and also yeah. we don't want to prematurely reset the stops only to find ourselves in a position that X weeks down the road we have to change them yet again that sort of uh, back and forth disruption uh, hurts continuity for our families as well as our bus drivers and everybody else so right, right. we do try to take a, a rather measured approach we don't ever want to change them to start with but sometimes we have to mm -hmm. and then we do that same measured approach to restore those stops afterwards but it, when we go back they're communicated to the families and the students of those affected 
uh, bus stops. And we want to make sure that communication goes out prior to the stop being implemented so that they can make whatever adjustments they need to do. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Mrs. Ellis. Thank you for your report. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at this picture, and uh, I, I know that the, the drop-off and arrival and pick-up um, can be a very stressful time at, at any school. There's a lot of kids coming in at once. Um, and when I look at this picture, I, I can see how, how much more difficult it must be for them um, at, at North County High School. Um, so I, I can identify the need there. Can you tell me um, how many students are we talking about at North County? About 2,400 students. Yeah, 2,400 students. So, um, so while the price tag sounds rather steep, we're talking about a quality of life issue for an awful lot of people. Um, as far as the non-signal um, intersections that you mentioned, um, I'm sure several of our schools have that. I know in Annapolis High School, the buses exit at a non-signal intersection, and we just use traffic guards to aid in, in the arrival and departure from the school. So is that how you would we've anticipate? Got, we've got both. We've got signalized intersections and non-signalized intersections across the county. Right. So they, so they just adapt it's not to whatever a big, the situation is. It's not a, it's, in other words, that's not a big problem. We can manage it through traffic. Uh, right. Cards. We would we would approach the state to ask for what's called a signal warrant study to have. It's a state road 648. Uh, so we would approach them to do a warrant study there to see if if a signal is warranted uh, or if they would uh, permit it. They do that based on traffic counts, sight lines, uh, uh, speeds, et cetera. But the state actually does that work, not us. Mm -hmm. um, and then. Um, we certainly would have to provide them traffic study information, counts, things like that. Uh, but ultimately, the decision of whether an intersection can be signalized or not is a decision by the state. But once they make that determination, the costs associated with constructing that improvement would fall back to the request, or in that case, it would be uh, us. Okay. So uh, where are we at this point, or is it up to us to decide if we want to? Oh. So, so great question. Um, I want to make it really clear that as your superintendent, I'm not make, I'm not recommending any of these options, okay. right? I'm not option one, two, or three. Um, I appreciate the time that the staff put in to give you so you could see the visual and understand some of the concerns. I'm not recommending any of these options. Are you recommending any sort of action whatsoever? No, ma'am, not at this time. And can you share what your concern is with why you would not? My concern is having to go through the process, the money, and having to go through the process of eminent domain and getting homes that people currently live in condemned. I don't want to have any part of that. Um, I realize it is a two-lane road going in and out. If you've not driven that, I'll certainly encourage you to do that so you can have that visual and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and know what it's like to go up that hill and make that left as you see that blue line and veer up to the school. Um, so you can get a, be familiar with it right there by the softball field. Um, and then likewise, uh, to work through a road, one that doesn't exist, um, uh, the future Burwood Road, um, or even to, to build a road on BG&E's right of way, I can't imagine that BG&E would want us to build a road along that right of way, um, and then trying to have to purchase the properties. You see that top triangle just above the tennis courts. Um, uh, uh, we would have to purchase that land or get the right of way to come through that back way. Um, those are not, I just think that it is um, uh, the money that, and the money, time, and energy that this board would have to go through. I just don't think it's worth gaining a 10 minutes of additional time of getting the students to school if that's what, in fact, it would do. So I'm not making, I'm not recommending any changes at this time. Okay, uh, Ms. Antwine. I, I just wanted to share, I, I understand in terms of the transportation element, it may not be something that's urgent. However, one way in and one way out is a safety concern. And if there are opportunities to consider opening up an, another means of, of that, that egress and ingress that you talked about, I think that is viable for us. In addition, our entire county is growing. 
So the the concerns that are there now only are going to get, you know, they're going to become bigger concerns if we don't get in front of it. So uh, if you, if I would request, Dr. Alato, if you don't agree with these, that you could please offer us maybe at the next meeting or next month's meeting, even on transportation, offer us some other solutions. I really, um, uh, we're glad to have conversations with the county government, um, but this is the best thinking of the team now. I cannot promise you that in two weeks' time or a month's time that we would have additional options. I think um, we're not going to be able to come in off of, 90, uh, off of um, uh, 197 and coming the back way. Coming up through the elementary school, as you mentioned, um, those are very, very narrow neighborhood streets, and to try and get that number of buses through those streets would just not work. Um, uh, those are options that have been looked at in the past. So I don't know that we would come up with other options in a two-week period. What I can promise you is that as we continue to have conversations with the county government and the Office of uh, and DPW, we're glad to mention that we have this ongoing concern. They know well the population is increasing in North County. Um, uh, Mr. Shaknovich and I were just in front of the, um, uh, the county executive two weeks ago where Mr. Shaknovich presented numbers and a PowerPoint presentation um, uh, to Mr. Pittman and some of his staff about enrollment numbers and increased growth in particular areas. And North County is one of those that, that, that he, we reminded him of the growth and the needs. So we're glad to continue those conversations, but I really don't believe that we'll be able to come up with anything other than what you've seen today. Could, could we at least for the next month's transportation discussion talk about those conversations and what came out of those conversations? I'm going to um, respectfully say no um, because we're in the throes of budget right now, so all of my time and energy, and Mr. Sheknovich is really tied to working with the county executive and the county council to work and promote your budget. And so I don't want to steer too many conversations away from that. We were with the county executive for an hour yesterday and his team making a case for your budget. And so I'm going to tell you, our time is really um, focused when we do have time with them. Um, well, and, and what I'll promise you is into the future, we'll have conversations about this site and about the traffic and enrollment. Um, but if you would um, uh, let us really focus on promoting your budget with the county executive and the county council over the next several months, that's really our focus right now. I, and and in I, terms of the capital budget, we had a, uh, had a conversation uh, with the capital debt affordability and the county's planning advisory board. We, our capital budget is not, is not and has not been funded in full um, at the right. local level or the state level. Our principal concerns have been focused on renovating, our old, renovating or replacing our older antiquated schools putting capacity additions such as kindergarten additions or classroom additions onto our schools and items that have a direct bearing on health and safety such as uh, asbestos abatement, security cameras, things like that. I'm not sure if it is the most prudent expenditure of $3 million to, to take those funds away from those other projects given a scarcity resource environment and redirect it to this. I mean, that's certainly a decision this board is going to have to to do, but in the capacity that I serve uh, for you as staff, I know again that there are many competing interests and interests that, in my humble opinion, may outweigh or outrank uh, something, something of this nature. We do have um, monies that we do for, you know, um, resurfacing and trying to keep up our existing infrastructure in many cases has to take precedence over something that, that would be sort of an expansion piece of it. But we'll, you know, we'll certain, certainly be glad to continue to look at things like that, like the superintendent said, but ultimately when we craft the CIP, we have to craft it with a light of what are our highest priorities given uh, limited capital dollars that the state and the county has to apply towards those efforts. Completely so. understand. I just see us at this point in time getting ahead of a potential bigger issue um, with those considerations and just having the information so that we can make better board decisions would be helpful, especially as, as we're discussing the budget so that we can plan and forecast for it. But thank both of you. And I'm sorry um, for 
some of the commotion. We're, we're about to transition um, in the next half hour. So I was writing some, uh, some guidance for um, uh, Mr. Rea. Um, Ms. Antoine, did you? Oh, you're finished. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Mrs. Shaheim. So I understand that roads are expensive, condemning homes is expensive, taking down trees is an environmental um, concern. Have we considered as a solution an A schedule and a B schedule so we don't have 2,400 students and buses and parents and teachers all utilizing the same road at the same time? This happens in a, vari of, you know, a variety of other schools and other places where half the school starts at X and the other half the school starts at Y. And then it breaks up that enormous traffic problem. Has that been considered at all by staff or by Dr. Alata? No, ma'am. We've not considered going to, to A and sch those those schedules actually existed in this jurisdiction many many years ago, as construction was going on in other schools. Um, Mr. Live might remember that uh, before my time, but that existed, uh, and and different school systems utilize that when necessary. I think what would take place first is um, we would focus on building our two new old mills and then doing redistricting. Mm -hmm. And while that's um, sometimes a difficult word for a board and a community to work with, um, I realize that, where we can create some, um, uh, some relief for a North County and, an, and, um, and a Glen Burnie, uh, that can happen when we build, we're hoping um, that when we build our two old mills, uh, the right. possibility of redistricting students out of these concentrated areas. I hear you, but that's many years down the road. Yes, um, ma'am. So you know, we talk endlessly, at least I have, and several of the rest of us have, about healthy start times and, well, putting the high school a little bit later and doing an A and a B schedule would alleviate immediately now these concerns without downing trees, kicking kids, kick, kicking people out of homes, et cetera. And I also just want to mention, because I just, you know, I heard it and I didn't, um, it's out, it's our budget, all of ours budget, not ours and versus yours. So I understand that you don't want to put any more um, effort into trees and um, roads and stuff, and that's totally fine. But um, you know, it's it's all of ours. I just, I just think that we should consider that, and I think we consider that we're, just because it was done once doesn't mean that bad is old, that old is bad. You know, like this would this would resolve this would resolve it, and would resolve the health issue that occurs with starting school at an early hour as well. And what a great segue back to the RFP, just saying. Okay. Any other board comments? Okay, well, I actually have a quick question, um, Mr. Chiknovich. Um, so y there was a couple comments about this being like one way in, one way out, and this is like a kind of alleviating it, it for the time's sake. Um, I was just wondering why this was the only high school chosen or looked at because uh, there are a couple other high schools that have like one way in, one way out. Because the question that was posed by the board was about this property, so we studied this property. Just this specific property? Okay. Thank you. Well, we've got 125 school sites. Many of them have only one way in, one way out. So is this like, would this be a transitional movement essentially? I know that this was the only one looked at, but to try to alleviate other start times, would this be like a transition, do you think, or? Uh, that, that wasn't the intention of this work, no. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Shalheim. So I guess my next question is, are we now talking about the RFP as it was stated during last meeting? So we can get rolling on that, not kick it down the road to another meeting. Okay. Okay, so uh, RFP question. Uh, public uh, public, one public comment card. Um, about transportation, then she asked about the RFP. Uh, uh, Ms. Van Buskirk. I'm going to get Bob to get my get to take a picture of you. When Good morning, Board of Education, Lisa Van Busker, start school later. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chagnovich, for looking at North County because it just brings up some uh, interesting discussions that I think it's worth having over the long term, which is your access in and out. And I appreciate Ms. Antoine's discussion of its not just about 10 minutes of start times and relieving traffic pressure, but if, God forbid, that there was some kind of active shooter or some kind of worst case scenario at that school, 
than to get fire, EMS, police response vehicles in and 2,400 students out. It would be nice to have multiple in out options. And so I think that is a worthwhile discussion to have with the county over the long term. And not just for North County, but any of your other sites um, as part of your operational plans. So I appreciate that discussion. And, you know, I think that's a part of the long term discussion over our schools and our safety and security. Um, for, regarding transportation, I just wanted to provide something that Howard County uh, was discussed at their last meeting. And so this is a handout that will be passed around to you. Um, I'm sorry for the crazy color, but it's a print of a green shot or a photo of a document that they discussed. And it was from uh, last spring, they did a survey of their bus drivers for violations. And in one day they had 290 violations and then they break down um, morning, afternoon, rear, front, left, right sides. And so what Howard County is doing with that information is the transportation department is now going to work with their county council to create some kind of permitted legislation and ordinance to discuss putting uh, cameras on their school buses to try and capture those violations and whatnot. So, um, so, they, so Howard County has approved the transportation department to, to start those conversations under our 2011 legislation. So it's just something for you guys to also think about with your relations with your law enforcement, because I'm sure we have more buses than Howard County, so I'm sure we have more violations. I don't think Anne Arundel County's drivers are any better. And so for the safety of our students on those buses when the arms are out. Um, other things that are going around the state in transportation, Baltimore County has included a transportation audit uh, line item in its FY 2020 budget, which will do much like what your RFP will hopefully do. And last month, Frederick County came back with some cost estimates for later start times of an 8 o'clock high school, 8.30 middle school, and elementary school at 9.15. The middle and high schools were delayed 30 minutes and um, elementary 15 minutes, and they came up with 57 buses and almost $7 million to do that. So in watching the discussions, they have some unique challenges because they're pretty rural, and they by only delaying the elementary schools, that is what required them to have some extra buses. And they also do a lot of after school elementary programs that they provide busing for. Um, they also have a one hour maximum bus ride length and they do what they call double box. So I think it's the bus doing the same route twice. I don't totally understand it. But there, so there are some other things going on throughout the state in transportation as other school systems also try to work on their transportation. So thank you. Thank you for, for your testimony. Um, the RFP um, and, and the status, um, I, I think there are going to be a, a couple of questions that, that we have to ask. Um, one is um, on status, uh, where that is, and then um, secondly, I, I think um, would be any break in, in protocol and procedure for the board to review an RFP at, at this stage. Um, and then third is the funding source for uh, the, the RFP. Um, so I, I will confess, um, I don't know if the intention was to have this as part of the transportation report or a separate item. Um, and I, if it was meant to be a, a, a separate item, I, I dropped the ball. Um, uh, okay. Um, the, um, I, I guess the, the first question then that I, I would ask um, Dr. Arlotto, at, at this point in, in the process, the, um, the status of the RFP is, is what? The, the status is it's completed. As we promised the board, the board spent um, considerable time discussing the scope of work uh, two weeks ago, and that was approved by this board. So now it is left to staff to do the rest, and that's what we explained at the time. And so we now have built all the pieces that go around the scope of work that we're required to do by law through purchasing um, processes and procedures, and that has been built, and we have that document. So, so we have done as promised. Um, the board's work, I, as far as I'm concerned, is done. You've approved the scope of work, what it is you want us to do, and now we've got to go out and accomplish it. So as far as I'm concerned, um, the board's work is done in approving the scope of work. We've now built all the pieces around it, and we have a document that's ready to go. So would the the RFPs are on our website, correct? When, when they're released, do they get issued on our aacps.org website? I, they don't go out on the website. They go out on the um, there are various purchasing, um, uh, I'm going to use the wrong word, vehicles, but uh, the mechanisms and platforms that we then push um, these purchasing um, uh, RFPs out. 
I'm sorry. Oh, the, and they are on our uh, .org website also. Okay, I stand corrected. Okay. They're on the website so, also. So the intent at this point would um, is is that the the opportunity for the board to see it, or or is there an advanced opportunity? Um, there's there there's advanced opportunity for the board to see it. Um, I would I would caution the board um, about getting too involved at this process, um, so that there are no concerns. Um, uh, going forward in case there was an appeal over a vendor or not getting um, and, and the, the process that I would want to keep the board out again it's the board's work is done in terms of the scope of work the rest is now up to staff okay and I, I've got probably one more question on, on funding sure. uh, but um, Mrs. Schalheim uh, my question is about timing so um, yes uh, I don't I totally agree we don't need to micromanage it now that we have done the scope of work totally agree don't need to see it glad that it's going to be put on the various sites or mechanisms or whatever that to get uh, visibility for the right people to persons people firms to bid on it uh, my question is about timeline now and when that will be going live that's my question. So we'll have to talk about funding because there is no funding um, there is no funding set aside for this um, study for this RFP so um, mm -hmm. I don't have a, a, a line item that I can attach to it um, and uh, this is a um, this is an interesting time of year in budgets as we're looking to close out at the end of June and start back up July 1 mm -hmm. um, so we have to um, uh, we'd have to if we want to try and do something in this fiscal year we'd have to get it out on the street and get something back and start to spend some of the money and then request a carry over into the new fiscal year um, we could you have set aside in your budget a um, little over two hundred fifty thousand dollars for some form of school system audit you could dedicate some or all of that money to this piece if that's what's important to the board and we could um, have it hit the street July 1 if approved through the County Council and move it forward at that time that's a possibility um, but one of the things that the team is working on now before we put certainly a con an RFP out like this at this level we have no idea what it's going to cost so right, right now the team is the 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 uh, purchasing team is making some inquiries right they're talking to folks around the state and country to find out who does this kind of work who are the vendors that do this that could meet this scope what does it in general cost it's not specific to the exact cost but we've got to get an idea before we put an RFP on the street I don't want to commit to putting something out there that we don't have the money for right so, so that work is now going on behind the scenes with the purchasing office that's wonderful when, when would they would are you going to follow up with are you going to circle back with us when they know what the price tag is so we can talk I, about where the money's coming from or sure I'm, I'm glad to it'll be a couple of weeks and they're out there sort of you Perfect. know talking to their contacts and others to learn more because we've not done anything to this scope and so we really don't know what it's going to cost that's helpful so that's that work is happening in the background as we speak Wonderful. if if, if i may uh, for just one moment um depending on the amount that that and, and I'm sorry if, if if this question had just been asked and I'll explain the commotion momentarily the board members know but I, I've got to explain what my personal situation um, this would come to the board anyway to vote on based on the the pricing amount so um, once a, a vendor is procured based on the contract amount we would then see it again as uh, a vote absolutely right yeah, as you do with any any of these contracts this is all thing, these are all things that staff handles and goes behind the scenes once we've gone through the RFP process RFP the the, the requests have been gone through the normal purchasing process a vendor would be chosen and the contract would come before the board for final vote on on moving forward and that that part is all great with me my my main concern is getting it out as a suit doing the, our due diligence to figure out what it might cost but then getting it out as soon as possible so we can get the process started as soon as possible and we we all know that there's going to be quite a hefty um, fund balance at the end of the year and I want to again reiterate for those who might not have heard that before that 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 does exist it it will occur and there's you know depending on what the, our lovely purchasing department comes back as an average cost um, you know there there is funding available that way Okay, uh, Miss Ellis. Okay, so um, this is 
great information. I'm happy about where we are. Um, I, I'm just not super clear on um, where we're going to go from here. So should we establish um, an agenda item to um, discuss the budget portion of it? We are going to, um, so I guess when and how can we expect to hear back on the, I, I guess we're looking for an estimate of the cost of this, so we can start to discuss funding. When? Uh, uh, oh, I thought, I'm sorry, I thought I'd answer the question, Ms. Shawheim. It'll probably be a couple of weeks before they're done and we've got some cost estimates, so we have a general idea before anything hits the streets. Okay. So it'll be a couple so, of weeks okay. before we have something from, purchase, from the purchasing office. I think that's fair to say. Okay, so I, my question, I, I know, Terry, you're trying to work out logistics, but should this be an agenda item for next time for us to discuss the funding of it based on the I, I in, think information we get about the cost of this? I, I think part of the complexity is we won't know what the potential amount may be. I'm, I'm, I'm going to make a suggestion. And um, uh, I don't know how popular this is going to be, but I'm going to ask you, the board, to let us do the work. That's what I'm going to ask you to do. So we're going to do some research, and then we're going to see what the amount looks like, right. and then we'll see if we can determine a way to come up with the money okay. to pay for what it is that you want to do. What I'm hearing, unless there's some dissent among the board members, um, I'm seeing shaking heads, that you want this to move forward sooner rather than later. I'm not, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Is that appropriate, yeah. Mr. President? That seems to be the case. Okay, so then if you'll let us do the work, Absolutely. we will let us do the work. That's all I'm going to let you, uh, and we'll, fig, we'll then have to look at the budget. I know that you're confident there's going to be money at the end. I'm not that confident. Um, uh, we always, we're, we're, we're plugging away to make sure we've got $13 million of carryover. That's the primary because that's built into our budget, right? The budget you've approved, we need to have that minimum as revenue for the next fiscal year. You know that. You guys have gone through that process. And so I'm not that, I, I, I'm, I'm concerned that we're going to make that, right? So we're looking at budgets and we're sweeping budgets and we <coughs> do this every year. It's the same dance we do every year to make sure we've got money to move forward. Um, based, and because I don't have any idea and my team doesn't have any idea what this is going to cost, I know when you and I last met, Ms. Shalheim, you had a number in your head, um, which I think is great, but I don't, I don't know that, I don't know, right, I don't know how accurate that is. Um, and so that's what we need to find out. So if you allow us to do the work, Absolutely. we will then come up, once we have an idea about what we think it will cost, then we'll see if we can, we'll look at the budget to see if we can find a way to at least get this started in this fiscal year with a way of carrying it over into the next. I, there's no way we'll get it out on the street, get this study done and paid for by the end of June. Not gonna happen. No, so I'm gonna have to look for a way to carry the money over into the next fiscal year. Does that make sense? That's extremely yes. helpful, thank, thank you. you. I, I wanted to make sure we were doing our part to move it along. I'm one of, I, thank we'll, you. We'll, we'll, we're working on it. Thank, thank you. you, thank you so much. Okay. Ms. Antwine. Um, so I, I will share with, with Dr. Alato, I, I agree that market research takes time and we want to be able, especially with the uh, extensive scope that we have, we, do, we certainly want to do the work and the due diligence necessary. But I think as the board, we also want to be able to know that it's not just at, at a stalemate. I, in those transportation reports, um, the, the spirit behind that was for such reports as these so that we could be informed on what's going on. And then I would uh, advise also against discussing openly cost estimates that are coming through the system in, in of terms of, of um, competition. So if, if we can probably look to how we can do that where the board is informed with the cost in order to make the decisions but not be open about that because of competition. Okay, um, that looks like we've got all of the board questions. Uh, I hope answered. A, a, another card for now. Um, got it, got it. Thank you. Okay, um, any uh, further public comment on transportation? Seeing none. Uh, we'll now move to our consent calendar uh, items 5.1 to 5.04. Is there a motion to bundle? These so items? moved. Second. Second. Any discussion on bundling? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 
Pose. Right. No, the ice have it. We now have um, a bundled action item. Dr. Arlotto, your recommendation, please. Yes, sir. Recommend board approval of the contracts as listed on today's agenda 5.01, 5.02, 5.03, and 5.04. Uh, we've got a couple of board questions on these items. Uh, Ms. Ellis. I just moved. I'm, I'm so sorry. I, <laughs> there, there is a uh, motion to. So moved. And, and a second? Second. Okay. okay. Uh, Ms. Ellis. We're, we're good. Okay. Whoops. Uh, Mrs. Hummer. Um, yes. Yeah, so um, 5.04 is um, the contract with social media alert system, which is grant funds. Um, I believe that these, these are funds from, uh, that we received as a security grant from, is this from the state, from the Safe Schools Act? And I just want to clarify, because I think this is correct, but I want to put it on public, that also with these same funds that we're looking to pilot with social media alert, we are having a town hall in May um, at Magathy River Middle School, where one of the Sandy Hook mothers, Michelle Gay, is coming to speak. Am I correct that these are the same funds? Correct. So the, 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 the governor put forward um, in the expansion in last year's, uh, uh, through last year's legislation, the governor moved forward with expanding the Maryland Center for School Safety, um, and they've now hired and expanding their work. And with that, there were two separate grants that were given to the Maryland Center for School Safety and the advisory board to administer. Um, and uh, those grants, one are on, uh, uh, and the main grant that school systems could apply for um, are upgrades to school safety. And it could be, um, some of it could be physical, um, and it could be um, uh, social emotional wellness for students. And so as part of that grant, um, we have, we are partnering with, or we are taking on um, um, uh, um, uh, this group, Social Sentinel. Um, one of their representatives is here with us today. Um, you heard about them while you were at the conference. They were the sponsors of one of the um, keynote speakers. Um, they've been doing this work for several years. We've been ongoing, ongoing conversations with them, and now with the awarding of the state grant, um, we're going to move forward, and, and we should be, with, with your approval, we'll be up and running in a month or so with um, Social Sentinel and the work um, in working to help better protect our schools and students. So, great. Thank you so much. And I'm also going to throw out again for the town hall um, with the Michelle Gay, the Sandy Hook mom. She spoke as she was the final speaker at the NSBA conference this weekend. And it's an incredibly powerful testimony she gives of her child and very impactful. But then the very real concrete steps that um, she and another mother have created a foundation to help schools to address. And so I'm thrilled that as part of this grant, we're doing the physical part. And then we're also bringing in some of the um, to a town hall type things to reach out to our community. So thanks for that. Thank you. Mrs. Shaheim. Um, I just wanted to say um, that I think it's great that we're moving forward to utilize, you know, utilizing the, the, the technology that now exists to, to monitor potential threats. I think it's great. I'm very excited about this particular piece. And, um, and so thank you for, for for championing that, Dr. Alato, appreciate it. I call a question. Okay. Um, we're we're out of light, so, so let's stick with the procedure. Um, question's been called. Is there a second? All in favor, say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. We now have uh, a vote on the consent calendar. Mrs. Connolly, would you please call the roll? Beginning with Miss Alice this morning. Aye. Mr. Grannon? Aye. Ms. Corkadel? Aye. Consent items. Ms. Hummer? Aye. Ms. Urea? Aye. Ms. Antwine? Aye. Ms. Shawheim? Aye. Mr. Live? Aye. Mr. Gilliland? Aye. 9 0 motion passes. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll now move to um, uh, action items. Uh, 6.01 is administrative personnel appointments. There are no there are appointments today. Correct. Item 6.02 is personnel. Dr. Arlotto, your recommendation, please. Yes, sir. I recommend board approve that the board approve the actions as stipulated on the attached sheets. I move. Second. second. Motion second. Any board questions? Seeing none, Mrs. Connolly, so vote on personnel. Would you please call the vote? Ms. Alice. Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. Ms. Corkadel? Aye. Ms. Hummer? Aye. Ms. Urea? Aye. 
Ms. Antwine? Aye. Ms. Schalheim? Aye. Mr. Live? Aye. Mr. Gilliland? Aye. Nine zero motion passes. Thank you. Item 6.03 is uh, new course approvals. Um, don't believe we have a staff presentation today, but are there any board questions at this point? Um, and then we'll ask for a superintendent recommendation. Uh, Mrs. Hummer. Um, looking at all these classes, which all look fabulous, as always, will these be offered to all schools, or are we starting at some schools and piloting th these classes? So to answer your question is yes, they'll be available to all, but they're not necessarily targeted to every single school. So they can be available, but at this point, some of them are specific to some schools. Okay. Uh, Ms. Antwine. Mine, of course, was about PVA. Hi, Skip. How are you? Fantastic. Um, you. Of course, these are excellent opportunities and programs. So I, I didn't quite understand the non-prime, um, the non-prime ensemble. This gives opportunities for students who are not in the PVA program, or just students who are in the PVA program but are not necessarily part of the primary ensemble groups. Okay, so for the record, I'm Skip Lee, I'm the Director of Curriculum. I brought uh, David Kaufman, who oversees our PVA programs, to address your question. Thank you. So what we were attempting to address is the fact that uh, several of our students who are involved in their primary prime course. So in PVA, for those that are not familiar, uh, prime is referred to as their focused content area. So if they are, uh, it, music is not a prime, orchestra is a prime, uh, choral music is a prime, dance is a prime. What we found was that for students, uh, because in the PVA program we have a double prime uh, course offering that is what gives them their arts immersion experience within their focused prime when we look at the uh, encore scheduling there is not by the time we talk take into consideration world and classical language by the time we take into consideration uh, their physical education requirements there's not actually a full year of opportunity in each of the years for a student who is currently involved in their primary uh, prime course to be able to also take a secondary ensemble and so what we have addressed here is uh, philosophically it's an arts immersion experience and to not allow students in that arts immersion experience mm -hmm. uh, potential access uh, to a secondary uh, uh, experience in the arts uh, was something that by design we wanted to correct uh, it the, the reason it is not, um, and I, I step to you having formerly been the music coordinator, uh, and so I, I'm familiar with the, the questions regarding this particular uh, conversation, middle school. The reason it is not afforded in our comprehensive school experiences is the nature of instruction over the course of the year requires an expectation or foundational level of musicianship that a student who is involved in another prime is going to have that would not necessarily be in place should they uh, simply just want to take the spring semester of, of chorus. So that's the reason for that uh, uh, clarification. It's a practice that's actually been taking place uh, at Bates and we wanted to clean it up and, and clarify it and uh, make sure that it, it reflected on the record correctly. Uh, excellent, so it, it, it emphasizes your efforts in the PBA <coughs> movement of arts integration. Got it, thank you very much. Yes. Ms. Corkadell. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, I had a couple questions um, concerning the gaming and logic. Um, I'll give staff a second. Just two, two real quick questions I was curious of. So I'm uh, inviting Dr. Gilmeister to the podium. Mm -hmm. For the record, Tina Gilmeister, STEM coordinator. Thank you, ma'am. Um, so I'm excited about this. Um, my son missed this opportunity by it will be a couple years um, in there. But uh, so is is this kind of like I know that some of the uh, outcomes that we're discussing. So that would be like uh, some Perl and Java to integrate some of their gaming environments to teach them. It's what really, they're actually learning about all that mm -hmm. when they do that? It's or? really a continuation of our movement in computational thinking into okay. the middle school level. And so com there'll be a foundation of computational thinking, and then the applications of that will be in gaming and logic. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. okay. Well, that that's exciting. Mm -hmm. um, I did note, though, um, and I just wanted to know if, 
it, I, I don't look at it as an omission, but I, just to consider it, just something I, w I was curious about. On the measures of success, I know that through our, through our, our CAP programs that there are children in this category that would be taking this course that would be integrating more into CAT, possibly even than STEM. So um, is that something that's considered and just not included? I, I was just curious because I can see someone applying this and say, get excited about getting a Cisco's, you know, you know their Cisco certification through CAT or something similar. I believe that the logical and computational thinking skills would be transferable across subject areas, including the technical programs as well as the computer science programs. Oh, I, I concur. I was wondering why it would not be part of the measure of success, because we talk about the kids transitioning into STEM, but we're with non-STEM kids to begin with, and I know in my school, the middle, uh, my middle school has a STEM, so they would be transitioning possibly to that also? or. Are you looking at the application to CAT centers to be added to the application to STEM Magnet High School program as a measure of success? Measures of success, yeah, that they would be their application, it would be applicable as well as student. So uh, that's all I see is STEM here. I didn't see the CAT and I, I'm... Was we can curious. certainly add that. Um, in well, I, I don't want to do your job. I was just wondering if that is an outcome. <laughs> well, when they that. apply in the ninth grade um, CAT program, it is an mm -hmm. exploratory program, so mm -hmm. it wouldn't necessarily be targetly focused into a Cisco Academy mm -hmm. or Networking Systems Administration, which would be the courses that would be applicable to this particular course. So there wouldn't necessarily be a direct correlation okay. at the ninth okay. grade level, mm -hmm. um, but we could look at higher levels if that's something you're interested in. No, no, I was just wondering, because that would spark an interest, mm -hmm. um, but that's, mm -hmm. it doesn't need documented. Okay. I was just wondering, I was just making sure I understood the course enough to mm -hmm. know that we're, we're finding, uh, I think it's exciting that you guys are finding alternative ways of sparking interest of something that otherwise is considered kind of frowned upon so from time to time. And in my, my household, my husband is in the industry, and so my kids, uh, we never saw the screen time necessarily as negative because we knew how to, you know, that was mm -hmm. an exciting moment for, in our, our regards, because um, we do let them do the programming, introduce them to. So I'm really excited that we're starting to do for our non-STEM to make sure that they're getting those um, wonderful Thank skills. You. And I'll, I'll just close on this one that I had a chance to chaperone at Northern Grumman um, with STEM students when my daughter was enrolled. And uh, when we were sitting down for lunch um, with the kids, uh, the folks at Northern Grumman and some of the mentors that came in of their employees had pointed out that, believe it or not, um, those skills learned in these environments are, are some of the most valued uh, that mm -hmm. are brought to the table when they mature, get their degrees, and become employees. And so I think we're definitely going and continuing to build an already successful program, and I thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Corkadell. Um, Ms. Ellis. Thank you, and forgive me if this is the wrong, I guess, place or opportunity to ask this question, but um, in light of that we're talking about um, curriculum development, new courses, um, quick question, has it been determined, can anyone answer yet, where in the magnet programs the global citizenship course is going to fit? Has that been built in yet? I'm only asking because I've had students in magnet programs, families raising concerns and just asking the question. So I just want to see, can we get an update where we are on that? I can speak for Stan. And, uh, it has absolutely been determined. We've been working through the Advanced Studies and Programs Office and all the coordinators of the magnets have been involved in that. Uh, specifically speaking for STEM, it will be involved in our freshman level problem and project-based learning courses. Um, and all of the content standards um, and frameworks have been provided and will be a part of the entire county curriculum writing related to that, as well as all professional development. Okay, that's helpful. Uh, any? Uh... Sure, so the IB program, similar. Um, creation of integration of the uh, standards for the GCC course are integrated into the scope of the IB program. Um, and David, same same answer, right? We have an extended. Right, so I, I specifically had PVA kids asking me, so I would love to hear what's going on there. Thanks. 
So because our PVA program is housed at Annapolis and Broadneck, we wanted to take into consideration all of the scheduling issues that are uh, that are affected by, by our locations there. Uh, we incorporated and, and uh, utilized our foundations, our freshman foundations uh, course. And so it is our GCC uh, will be uh, during the extended day uh, portion uh, so that we aren't taking up that uh, location in the day, but we're able to integrate that with the arts uh, focus during that foundations period. Okay, um, I, there. This is a great opportunity for me because the, there's a rumor mill, and so um, PBA kids have a different understanding. So I'm glad to get this and, answer, and yep. so I'm. I, so I'm. I'm suggesting communication at this point no and, and and i will let you know that, that that is something that is a very recent uh solution uh, as we were looking at, yeah. at the various scheduling uh challenges uh so we will definitely get that messaging out so thank, thank you thank you so much mm -hmm. That's where the concern was. Absolutely, will be continued in that vein. So Excellent. I just wanted to bring that up for yeah. the record. Yeah, thanks. <coughs> okay, thank you. Ms. Antwine. <laughs> so so I had, I had questions uh, uh, back on the gaming and logic. Uh, but, uh, Ms. Corkadell, thank you for bringing up some of those key points. I'm thinking about in terms of tech credit. <laughs> much like what the students can get uh, in middle school with their language and the other, other arts, could they get high school credit for, uh, uh, for their technical requirement in the middle school if they took this course? Uh, at this time, this course does not meet the standards for the ninth grade tech credit. Um, that's something we can look at if that's something the board's interested in, but the way the course is written, it would not meet a high school tech credit requirement. Okay, because I'm looking at what you guys provided in the description, and we talked about computer science coding, mm -hmm. right? We talked about, um, I'm, I'm looking at building websites, mm -hmm. I'm looking at some applying logic and design. Those are all part of that underlying tech requirement. Mm -hmm. So could we look at how we can possibly um, align that so that so that the course some of the base the fundamentals of the course requirement the tech requirement now how can we align that so that students can possibly get a technical mm -hmm. technical we can certainly look at that and it would also encourage the students to take the course mm -hmm. um, so then my other question is on the strategic reading supports at middle school and high school levels um, I love it. I just was not understanding if this was going to be offered as an enrichment outside of the classroom or is this an additional course for credit? So great question. Both the two parts of that are very, very uh, important. Why don't you two have a seat and we'll, we'll let you guys go that way. So this particular course, new course proposal is a solution to a current situation in our uh, reporting on our transcript. And so what I'm going to do is allow um, these two ladies to address that question, the target population for which these courses are being created, and the um, overall uh, outcome of what we expect for the courses. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. For the record, Diane McGowan, Coordinator for Specially Designed Instruction, K-12. Uh, for the record, Gabby Sheckles, Literacy Specialist, uh, K-12 Special Education. So this course was collaboratively developed between our English language arts offices at the middle and high school level, as well as the special education offices. The intent is to create a course code for our students that are receiving tier three interventions so that rather than having to come to you each year to change the course name because we have different interventions based on individual student needs, we can create this generic course code for these these individualized students and meet be able to meet their needs thank you thank you for for that just for the record how many approximately how many students are we talking about countywide right now we're talking about 12 to 15 students we have an intervention continuum that are available to most of our students and but there's a very small population of kids that need something different um, typically, it's when our office is involved, so we wanted a course code to really reflect that. Yes, yeah, please, please. So, so 12 to 15 countywide at the high school and middle school levels? Correct. Okay. 
Um, so, so with that being the case, is, is it possible that with it being under 20 students countywide that more students may need that enrichment is the reason you wanted to introduce this as so it's in it so we have um, reading interventions at the middle and high school levels that has a much larger number of students that access those interventions this is a very small number of students with very unique learning profiles that those interventions may not be the right fit for so we would like this course go to to basically allow us to do something that's a little more matched to their learning needs. So it's a customization of the Correct. Great, thank you. Um, I see no further lights. I, I don't believe there are any more general questions at this time um, for superintendent's recommendation. Dr. Arlotto. Yes, sir. I recommend that the board uh, approve these courses beginning um, for the 2019-2020 school year. So moved. Second. Okay. Any specific discussions on the motion? Seeing none, uh, is there any public comment? Seeing none, at this time, Mrs. Conley will take the vote on the new courses. Ms. Ellis. Aye. Aye. Mr. Granin. Aye. Ms. Corkadell. Aye. Ms. Hummer. Aye. Ms. Urea. Aye. Ms. Antoine. Aye. Schalheim. Aye. Mr. Leib. Aye. Mr. Gillen. Aye. Nine zero motion passes. Thank you, Mrs. Connolly. Uh, we now move to item 6.04, which is um, policy DK, financial fraud, waste, and abuse. It is on third reading for final approval. Dr. Arlotto, your recommendation, please. Yes, sir. I recommend board approval of policy DK, subject to final correction for style and format. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. 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 Okay. Any board discussion? Seeing none, any public comment? Seeing none, Mrs. Connolly, would you please call the roll on policy DK? Aye. Aye. Ms. Hummer? Aye. Ms. Rea? Aye. Ms. Antoine? Aye. Ms. Schoenheim? Aye. Mr. Leib? Aye. Mr. Gillen? Aye. Nine zero, motion passes. Thank you. Now move to item 6.05, which is uh, a first reading policy revision, grading policy code II. Ms. Ortiz. Good afternoon. For the record, Jeanette Ortiz, Legislative and Policy Council. Uh, today we have policy II grading before you for first reading. This policy was last updated on January 18th, 2017. Per the request of the policy committee, policy II has been revised to eliminate class rank by way of eliminating valedictorian and salutatorian recognition beginning in the 2021-2022 uh, school year. These proposed revisions will be posted on our website for 30 days for public comment, and my colleagues and I would be happy to answer any questions, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Good afternoon, Jason Dykstra, Executive Director of Instructional Data. Uh, Maureen McMahon, Deputy Superintendent, Academic Strategic Initiatives. Maisha Gillens, Office of Equity and Accelerated Student Achievement. Thank you. We have a couple of questions. Michelle Hunt. Um, hi. Uh, thank you for bringing this before us um, for first reader. Um, you know, we, we immediately started getting emails, and so I just wanted to use this time to. Um, dispel fact from fiction and myth and rumor mill and all this and so and it was an education for me because when I was going through this was Valsal was the standard and that was I, I don't maybe the other maybe the Latin um, uh, Honors. honor thank you um, system existed but I don't it wasn't used as widely can you can you uh, explain for us um, what colleges look at today for those, I mean, the really exceptional students and, and how, how this would affect scholarships and that, those sorts of things. Thank you. So over the years, the Latin honors has become more common. And what, what the top colleges in the nation, and that's some of the most elite private schools and some of the largest, most elite public schools, are looking at predominantly the top 10% of the class, right? Now that's for entrance level. Right, 10% of the class, depending on the size of the school, is a different number of students, right? So when you're only talking Val Sal, 
that's two students. When you're talking about the 10% of the class of one of our common high schools, that's quite much larger, right? We have 500 in the class, 10% is 50 students, right? So it's a, it's a different story. Now when you're talking about scholarships, well first of all I should say to you in the last years, the, the notion of the number of colleges looking at ranking has gone down to around 20%. And that's not a must, that's a we still consider rank, meaning we're asking, but we're not mandating. So that's important. So in the 90s, that was at 50%, now it's at 20%, and going lower every day. The College Board has information on their website, if you check out the College Board web, suggesting that rank is only one piece now, and most often optional with the most elite colleges. We did a check, and. Um, this was under student services, and I thank um, the counseling office and Ms. Pelham for the work that they did, looking at the major institutions that our students go to. So everybody in Maryland, from the Naval Academy to the University of Maryland College Park to Towson University, Johns Hopkins, and all of the University of Maryland schools, at this point in time, it's no impact for the application to not have a ranked school. No impact. So that's important for you to know. Now, that's different than scholarships. So we talk scholarships for a minute. Many of the most elite scholarships that historically would say Val Sal now say Val Sal or top one or two percent of the class. So one percent of a class of 500 is five students. That's beautiful because we find that most often five to ten of our students really look like a Val Sal. They're within a thousandth of a point of one another. So really, when we talk equity, the idea of where you're considering moving is, is fair and equitable. And Ms. Uh, and Dr. Gillens, I know, has feelings about that with respect to our equity efforts. There wasn't a direct question, no, so <laughs> So yes, I echo Dr. Uh, McMahon's um, sentiment about class ranking. I do want to add another perspective, if, if I so may, about social emotional. That's the area in which I'm concerned about. The, there is research that was written, I'm going to quote some of it. Um, according to the literature, eliminating class rank lessens hyper competition and stress at a crucial time in a high school student's lives and encourages the college to view the whole person rather than to use class rank against student students. So there's something to say about the pressure that the current system, the ranking system can place on students. So I do speak from that perspective of mental health. This is all um, wonderful information. <coughs> Excuse me, I had one more question about this. Um, oh yes, but if a school decides that for some reason they really, they really, they need to see that ranking, it's my understanding, just for the benefit of the public listening, that if, if, it's, if a college or university really, really wants to see that, that, that is something that can be printed out and provided to that, to that institution. Is that correct? Even if we remove VALSAL officially? Uh, no, ma'am. Um, no. The way the system works, it's, that's coded, and if the board policy were to be changed and edited, um, class rank would not be available in Anne Arundel County public schools. We would be able to certainly calculate percentages, um, but we would not calculate class rank. Oh, okay. So that, we, we would be able to tell a school that yes, this student falls within the top 1% of a class of 500. So they would know that that student is within the top five students in that class. Got it. Which is what they're looking for. They're right. looking for an ability to narrow, but not necessarily narrow to one or two. So no one, the Ivy League or otherwise, is, is really interested in one versus two versus third versus whatever in the I class. will say, I cannot say no one. I can just right. say it is going way absolutely down. way down. And in fact, um, if we, we spoke to many of the counselors across the system this year to say, 
when your schools have applied, when your students have applied for these elite scholarships and these elite schools, has anyone come back with really needing to know? And this year we've gotten yeses. That's been an interesting change. That's, um, that's wonderful to hear. Um, I, think, I think I'm good for now. Thank you so much for answering all my questions. Thank you. If, if I could jump in, just so um, for the board, if, if board members are not aware, when a student applies to college, not only is their transcript sent from their high school, but a school profile is sent. Um, and that's a very important, if you talk to anybody in NACAC, the National Association of, of, of Counselors um, and, and College Admission Counselors, that's a really important document. Not only is it the student transcript, but they need to, they need to know what does this transcript tell me? within the context of that school and that school system, where we talk about what is a PVA, what is a STEM class, so they can interpret the transcript. And so the explanation of not having a class rank would be part of that profile for all of our schools. So they, the, the colleges would have that information in the admission office, that would be part of what is sent with the transcript. Thank you, I did remember the question. So you said you looked back at the data of where, we're, of where our students are going. How many years did did you look back and did you contact all of those schools or was it just last year? So we have, we have where they're going in the last two years, three years. You know, we have years of data. Right. But we were looking at the predominant places that our students go and also some of the high reach schools that they go to. So we looked at two, four, six, eight, 15 colleges and those are a lot of Maryland schools and then a lot of the top schools, I mean, we picked Harvard, Princeton, Virginia Tech, Caltech, Brown, MIT, University of Chicago, right? They're on the, among the list because those are the reach schools for a lot of our students, or Perfect. the desired schools, I shouldn't call them reach schools, because our students can and do attend these schools. Um, so we made sure we were hitting some small and some large schools. Um, so Swarthmore, for example, is a school that many of our students apply to and get in, get accepted to. That's a school that, um, has changed their whole admission policy almost entirely over the last 18 months. And it's, it's, it's wild to hear the stories of what they're going through. So I think um, this is a cultural shift in higher ed. And, and thank you for that. All right, I, now I'm done, I promise. When you mentioned, Dr. McMahon, um, Virginia Tech as, uh, as an elite school, superintendent almost fell out of the chair. I just <laughs> want to say <laughs> Um, and UVA. <laughs> Virginia Tech is a fine, fine institution, right, Miss Matioski? Yes. Um, <laughs> a little Virginia rivalry there. Um, Dr. McMahon, I, I apologize. Uh, I, I've got a, a quick question. I'd like to defer to my colleagues first before I ask a question, but I need to get on a flight um, uh, very quickly um, to get to Denver for the Online Learning Consortium. It's their annual conference, and I, that's a space of interest for me. Um, my question specifically on this, though, is, um, you know, two years ago, the question I asked was, um, I get where you're coming from, Dr. Gillens, and, and that was the same um, uh, direction I was taking from an appreciation perspective of, of the mental health and the anguish of somebody stressing over, you know, one one hundredth of a point, um, and, and I, so I, I get that. My concern was whether any of our students would be disadvantaged compared to a neighboring jurisdiction or, or even elsewhere uh, in the country by not having that distinction. You know, so for instance, do we have valedictorians that get valedictorian only scholarships? Salutatorians probably less of an issue. The answer in January 17 was yes that some of our students then would lose scholarship opportunities because of that particular distinction. And that day of is when I changed my vote. And I remember our prior board president at that time, Mr. Korbelak, changed her vote as, as well because that was something that uh, I think we both felt strongly about. Um, so that's a question that I'll pose again. Doesn't I, I'm, I didn't give you advance warning, so I know that data may not be in front of you um, uh, now, but I know we've got second and third reader to, to discuss that. But I just want to go on the record as, as saying where I've got some concern, um, certainly understanding um, some of the other arguments, and passionate arguments, um, but that is still a concern of mine if we are disadvantaging our students compared to Howard, Montgomery, or, or elsewhere. So. 
At this point in time, we didn't look specifically at that for this, pres you know, for this, we were just answering questions today. However, we can go back and look at that. But what I will say to you is, it's a double-edged sword. If there is a university out there that is giving a scholarship to only the, va the valedictorian, and it could well be, that's one side of the coin, and that's if we don't rank, maybe somebody misses that. But what we're hearing from our parents through my office is the opposite side of that which is my student is in the top seven students, the top five students, the top four students, top 10. So they're in the top 1% or 2% of the class and colleges are giving scholarships for that, right? And because we do Val-Sal, only the Val-Sals get chosen because the way the scholarship reads is, if you rank, you must be Val-Sal. If you don't rank, you must be in the 1% or 2% top of the class. So since we rank, five kids are not considered. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. So we will go back and do some work for you for that because it's a good question, but I do want you to consider both sides. And, and then certainly, I, I appreciate that, um, not just the institutional scholarships, you know, certainly Yale may have that verbiage or Princeton and so forth, but, you know, I'm making up one, so forgive me for labeling, but Xerox Corporation mm -hmm. then says valid, I, I don't know that for sure, but valid, you know, valedictorian only, you know, to qualify for a $10,000 Xerox Corporation scholarship uh, or PepsiCo, uh, you know, wh whoever the corporation question. is. Um, if, if we have reach into to that, and I know that, Two years ago, two plus years ago, was a, a big fact-finding mission, and, and I know it's laborious, and I apologize in advance, but I just like having that uh, data point to help make a, an informed decision. Okay. Um, Mr. Granite. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, President Gilliland. I was actually going to raise that same point, having been um, pretty active as part of that discussion, and I do recall, in fact, your answer to that question was dispositive to both Mr. Gilliland then and then uh, then President Stacey Korblack and who changed their votes. So a majority of the board just two years ago um, voted to maintain valedictorian and salutatorian and in fact revised the superintendent's proposal to incorporate Latin honors while maintaining valedictorian and salutatorian, which a number of other school systems do. We, uh, I know that information was brought before us as well. So I, I guess I have some concern in particular because that issue garnered, um, I think most, Ms. Ortiz can comment on this, um, Just I'll just use a colloquial term, way more public comment than we usually get. And we got a lot, maybe bordering on hundreds of public comments that were submitted, uh, as well as public testimony on this issue. And that was all taken into account by the board members who voted on this just two years ago to maintain uh, valedictorian and salutatorian. So I guess um, that, that's the one concern that I have. And, and wh why did you all not consider, to the extent you, you did consider other options other than just getting rid of class ranking entirely, why did you not consider an option to simply maintain valedictorian and salutatorian and eliminate other class rank, a numerical class rank? The proposal didn't come from staff. It came so from the not, policy this is not committee. Being it's not being recommended by Dr. Rolato. So this came from the policy committee. So this was recommendation from the policy committee. I was asked to bring the grading policy for review. Um, we brought it to them as is, current policy right now. There were no proposed um, revisions or amendments. And so based on that discussion that was had at the policy committee, um, what is before you, the proposed revisions, is what was determined and voted upon by the policy committee. If I can jump in, um, Mr. Granin. So, yes, it was brought up to the policy committee, um, and I just asked for an elimination of class rank to be written up. Um, but we can certainly, I guess, um, if you want to, because there's different ways that different counties do it. For example, Prince George's, they eliminated class rank of you knowing it, but on, I don't know which day, but when you're a senior, you will not get notified if you are number one or number two, but you will not know your whole high school career so that it doesn't, again, mitigate that comparison. But there are other ways, yeah. But this is the one way that I particularly 
pushed, yeah. Well, in follow-up just to what you're saying, it's, mm -hmm. it sounds like we did not necessarily consider that option. So what you're saying, it sounds like we could get the best of both worlds, Ms. Urey, because you're saying that students would not be, you know, basically by the middle of their freshman year of high school entering this race mentality, mm -hmm. but at the end of it, after working to whatever level they felt comfortable, they and their family felt comfortable with them pushing themselves, at the end, it's just basically it, it, it would be almost serendipitous that they would determine they would be determined to be valedictorian or salutatorian. So that's possible, and yeah. and still achieve your objective of getting rid of the kind of excessive class rank mentality that starts when people, uh, you know, finish basically the first semester of their freshman year. Mm -hmm. Okay. So From, if you all could yeah. consider that, that that would be great because uh, I, I think that might be a, a, a direction that a majority of the board would be leaning. Are you based, based on for based, something? Well, I, in, in, is there yeah? Is there a belief that? Yeah, there's no motion for that. Are you motioning to bring it? Well, I, I certainly could do that, and so that would be what would go out for public comment. So to to accomplish that, then because since it says in section D, the superintendent is authorized to develop regulations to implement this policy, I don't think we'd be specifying in this document everything that you're saying now about well, people don't learn the class rank until they actually graduate. I think the simplest thing to do uh, to accomplish that would be to simply restore the last sentence, especially given the history of this, that the majority of the board voted just two years ago based on, like, a lot of public input to simply maintain the valedictorian and salutatorian, and the implementation of this would be that there would not be a published class rank that is, is made knowable to anyone, frankly, until graduation. It would just be those two. I personally, I know this was majorly pushed by me and Dr. Alato. I, I would not be for that. But if you're motioning for something, then. So yeah, you okay. Motion. I'll second it. I never heard. Of, is there a motion? Yeah, that was my motion. Second. So my my motion, as as further contextualized by my comments, is simply to restore the last sentence. Under where? Could you specify? Under uh, C seven. So high school shall annually designate a graduating valedictorian salutatorian would be restored. But when it, would, are you motioning also for an implication that it would not be notified until that last? Well, you can't have you can't have a valedictorian salutatorian until people graduate, right? It, you can't you wouldn't have a valedictorian after junior year. Okay. I mean, if it would make you feel more comfortable, we, we could insert the two words, upon graduation. It's your motion. I think restore, I, I think we're, you, you don't have a valedictorian, salutatorian until people graduate, so I, okay. I think it's, it's in there naturally. So okay. the motion is to restore the last sentence. Okay, other board comments? Ms. Corkadell? Um, I, 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 I have a process question, actually. So um, in a first reader to third reader, does that get, do we do preliminary suggestive amendments typically in a first reader, or do we amend final in third, or both opportunities? I was curious. Um, that is question. So typically the way, um, since I've been here for just over two years, and I don't know if it was done differently previously, um, we bring it for first reading, you know, for consideration. There's sometimes board discussion, sometimes not. We put it out for public comment, and then based upon public comment, as Mr. Grannon correctly stated, this a couple of years ago, and I actually, my first board meeting was on second reading of uh, this policy change. And so there was a lot of public comment, and so I imagine we would probably get a lot of public comment um, here. And so typically the board has then perhaps um, suggested amendments on second and or third reading, um, kind of waiting to see um, how public comment goes. So it sounds to me because of the possibility of a more intense public comment that we would want to propose as what our options would be in a consensus before we move on to the second reader for this one in particular to uh, so that there would be as much opportunity as possible for the public to comment, 
or is it preferred at the second reader by your opinion? Um, oh, wow. So I don't know if there are any Roberts rules uh, associated with this, just from my recollection in the policy, um, the policy setting policy. I don't think you're prohibited from, you know, putting forth revising what we uh, presented to you or if you wanted to revise, provide more than one option. Um, that's certainly up to the board to determine that. So it sounds like our motion is, is fine and okay, and then if it were to approve, then the amendment would move forward as the sent to public, correct? Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you very much for the clarification. Ms. Antoine? Thank you. My, um, first of all, as always, thank you guys for taking that time and knowing that these guys caused this. We'll talk about <laughs> this in closed sessions. But, um, my first question was what what prompted the change especially with all this coming on realistically a year and a half after the board has weighed in on it and uh josie with you certainly being a senior this year i'm thinking something something encouraged the change um that you can choose or choose not to to discuss um then my second question is because it came across um, I, I was forced to look up research because you're right, over 20 some years ago, I, I was fighting hard to get that number one spot and it was enjoyable for me. It wasn't a mental kind of situation for me. I was looking over at the, you know, my competition, summing it up <clears> to <throat> see how I could best get that number one spot. And it, uh, after a while though, things happen in this life that caused me to kind of give up on that effort academically I would say based on my research that I am I learned that there is a sincere mental health concern out there not so much for those that didn't get top honors but for those that did the pressure of becoming whatever after that you know or the facade that's created around them and the expectations that are created around them became concerning I also looked at how it, um, if in terms of discriminator, and with the competition being more <clears throat> open now at the colleges and universities at a global stance, whereas way back in my day, the state was about what I was looking at, at a global stance, how that serves as, as a discriminator. I believe students having that ranking they should understand and know where they rank in school to encourage them to to keep going. If they go to say in, in their 10th grade year and you say, hey, you're, you're right now you're ranked number 20 of 400, well, that's going to encourage that person to, to try to do better from that ranking standpoint. And as a mom that's feeling, helping someone to fill out scholarships and things like that, they are asking, you know, what makes you different? And if you have something like, say, I'm the top of my class, I'm top 10%, that is a strong discriminator. So I'm a little bit baffled as to what happens if we take that out to the students overall because it has worked. And you know, it's a traditional known good, so. Well, we should make one clarification. They will know the percentage that they're in. They will be able to know you're in the top 10%, 15%, 20%, 20%. The difference, difference between that and ranking for second, third, fourth, fifth. So with respect to your motivation piece, we can tell them at any given time, are you in the top 10%, top 20%, whatever you, you know, whatever we would like. So say on the, on the transcripts at the bottom right now, it says, hey, Candace Antoine, your number, I'll give myself number 20, right? The number 20 of 400 on there right now. If we change this, that that goes away as well? The number 20 goes away, but not the fact that you're, you know, in the, in the top 5% of the class. So it will, it will annotate at the bottom, this person is currently in the top 5% of the class. Well, it could, if we so chose it to. And then on those profiles that Dr. Lotto was speaking to, it would talk about the number of students and the percents and how many students are doing what in the various programs in that school that fall in the top 5%, 10%, 20% of the class. So 
just one more question on that. I am the student that, that doesn't know about profiles being read and how they're looking at me. How do I know where I am uh, if I don't know until I graduate? How, how, oh, how does the, the student know? Many of the students don't necessarily go up and say, where, where am I right now? But having something like this already annotated that gives them some idea of where, where they are, where they can improve or, or maintain. So right now, if they wanted to know their rank in Anne Arundel County Public Schools, they would have to ask that question of a counselor. If they wanted to know if they were in the top 10% of the class, right now they would ask a counselor. So we don't give them their rank, you know, so many times a year as it stands right now. If they inquire, they could learn it, just like they could learn where they fall in the percentiles. But um, it wouldn't, wouldn't really be any different in that sense. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, but that's the. Right, I'm just looking at what I, I'm receiving currently and sending out there on behalf of somebody else. And, and it shows his, uh, where he falls in the class of whatever. And that has helped him in terms of his cover letters that he writes, in terms of his motivation to do better or, or sometimes worse. Um, but it, it, it's, a, it's, it's more to it at that point. And I understand maybe the point zero 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 point nine point 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 that makes the difference at the top. But I am also looking at other students that may not be at that top, but this is still the, having that ranking is helping them in terms of motivation and doing better. Ms. Ellis. Thank you. So uh, my daughter just last year went through the, uh, she was senior, went through the college application process. I seem to recall whenever she met with her counselor for um, course selection um, or um, when she had to meet with him for a college application that she was given a transcript that had her rank on it, correct? Absolutely, that's right. often, it's common practice. Okay, okay, so I, I just wanna make sure I remember that correctly. So it is provided to students, maybe without them asking, but it's there. Um, so, <coughs> You said un under saying we move forward with the new policy, um, students would be given their percentage instead of their rank. Would that be done in the same way? Would it be on their transcript? Because you can only determine that by ranking them, correct? Well, yeah, it's all the same math, right? And, and right. so it's just a... It, it's a different way of stating it. You're in the top 1%, 2%, 5%, however we wanted to. Well, that's what I'm, I guess that's my mm -hmm. question. Are you doing it in ranges? Because right. if you give them percentile, that's basically like right. ranking them anyway. So if they needed to know for a scholarship whether or not they were in the top 1% of the class, we could tell them that. On the report card, we would make some determination of putting down, the on the, I'm sorry, on the transcript, on the transcript of right. what we would put down. But the point would be, um, they would be able to know that information. Okay, so the transcript, what would the tran would every transcript have some sort of percent on it? So students who are in the <laughs> yes, we, top we can absolutely eighty percent. I mean, right. I mean, we, we can got... determine whatever cuts or thresholds we would want to report to a student or or a family. Okay. Absolutely, we can we can hard, so, but we are talking about that. thresholds and not individual correct we would percentiles be, yeah, correct we would m approach it more from a cohort right a group yes and we'd say okay. you're you're we've done the calculations you're in the top one percent or whatever thresholds or cuts that we thought really spoke and communicated a certain level of achievement on the transcript we would have the ability to do that okay and in in terms of the policy that we're discussing I don't Maybe I need to, I, I guess I was just looking at the changes, but I, I don't even see rank mentioned. Is that in the regulation portion of it? Yes. Okay, so, sorry, I have a couple more things. Um, so the way I'm seeing it, more and more districts are moving towards what we're discussing, potentially doing here today. And the more districts that do that, um, it, it really is going to put institutions at a disadvantage to continue to require valedictorian status because it's going to really 
narrow. Well, what the colleges are, that we're speaking to directly are telling us is that rank is one of several elements that they consider. And at this point in time, the college board is reporting that it's the personal statements, the essays, the teacher and counselor recommendations, leadership experience, and individual talents of applicants that supersedes the rank. With, however, the challenging courses taken throughout the child's career in high school and at the honors and advanced waiting level if, if that works for them, you know, with the grades that they earn. But with those other pieces, they're finding that rank they're telling us they're finding that rank is not needed. And in fact, because of the mental health, and the colleges and universities are really speaking to the mental health as much as the K-12, right? Because the colleges and universities are really suffering from students not uh, being able to independently really s survive in a, in a good way um, right. in large numbers. They're, really, they're finding that. It's on the national scene right now. So they're worried about the mental health as well. So they want a well-rounded young person. So they're saying that by taking the rank out, in the conversations we're having on the phone, by taking the rank out, they're still getting what they need. They're still awarding excellence, and they're um, de-escalating the stress, they believe. So uh, this is obviously just <laughs> anecdotally, but I, I, th I think it really speaks to it. I, I, I know of a student who made every choice based on achieving that number one spot and was emotional for me severely disappointed in the outcome of their college search reached for all those top schools and really expected a lot <laughs> different results than the student got and the student was was very disappointed about the choices they made because of that. So the mental health piece, it goes all the way up to the top. I mean, that top student who, that's an amazing accomplishment, and for that student to be disappointed in themselves for having made those choices and not had the result that they thought they were gonna get from those choices. Um, so to, to me, to maintain <coughs> this um, class ranking for what's becoming more and more limited opportunities for that number one student, um, because colleges, I, I believe, are looking for more well-rounded students. Um, I, I don't think we should make a decision for those very, very few rare opportunities when we're talking about the mental health of all of our students. And I just wanna jump in <coughs> to, um, before I go to the next lights, um, is that one thing, so a couple years ago when it first came ahead, because I was involved in CRASC when it first came, and I was strongly against getting rid of it. I was like, this is ridiculous. Like, why would you take that away from students? But then, like, you realize that we're told, like, as students not to go on social media and compare yourself to others, like, love yourself for who you are. Those, it's very bad for you. But then you walk into a school every day and you're like, wow, I'm 45 out of 500, like I'm not that good. I'm not as good as number one. And it's like you're comparing yourself every day and that's swaying your decision in certain aspects of your career field and the high school career. And I just think that's toxic. And I think that this really, and from what I've heard from Fairfax County that doesn't rank, from Montgomery that doesn't rank, Howard, Prince George's, um, that as soon as they took it away, it really changed up the way students look at their choices in classes because it's not I'm gonna take this class because I want to try to boost my GPA and be better than somebody else because that's your success coming from overcoming somebody else but it's rather I'm gonna take this class because I know that it's gonna challenge me and develop me in this certain way and I've also seen um, a lot of emails about comparing it to trophies for all and the Olympics like Olympics being one two three medals but I wouldn't compare the school system to the Olympics because in the Olympics you all focus and focus on one goal and there's, for example, skiing. There's one slope that you all are traveling down on, but in high school there's Cat South, there's the magnet programs, there's all these different programs where it's going different routes to not even get to the same destination. So I, I just, that's why I'm definitely for this. <coughs> 
Yes, when um, at NSBA this weekend, I went to several sessions that were on um, student mental health and also, um, you know, how, how increasing performance at high poverty schools. And at multiple of the sessions, one of the things they brought up was going to a Latin honor system. Um, and that stood out to me in multiple ones. It is a way that I have loved it the past two years at graduations to see the number of students wearing stoles that recognize their hard work. So instead of just two students you know, up on stage, we have a wide range of students that are being recognized and honored for their hard work, including our students who make choices to take programs that are not necessarily the most weighted. And so they're never going to have a chance to be number one, but they're, getting, they're going to Cat North and they're making great grades and they're coming out career ready with Latin honors, they are recognized for their achievements just as much as the people in the others. I know for some of us who have children in choice programs, actually in the magnet programs, you're at a disadvantage that you cannot necessarily become um, a valedictorian or a salutatorian because of the classes that you're taking. And those are students pursuing their passions, but um, you know th that is a, 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 a choice that they make not to have it, but that does not mean that they didn't work just as hard and they'd be recognized. Um, I loved what Ms. Urea said about that it's not just the one path. It used to be that we all took the same curriculum when we were in, college, in high school, and we just don't anymore. There's too many options. We're comparing apples to oranges when we're looking, trying to make a ranking of one one to number five, you know, is real, number one really doing better? We're doing different pathways. I did a lot of research over the past few days looking up articles and things from the college board and others about what's going on with this. And again and again, the college admissions officers are saying, Val Sal has li very little weight with us anymore because it's so different school to school. There are schools that name every child above a 4.0 is valedictorian. So they will have, they don't distinguish between a 4.2 and a 4.3, it's everybody above a 4.0, there'll be hundreds of valedictorians. That doesn't tell you a lot, and then you have a school of 25 children. The valedictorian at a 25 student class is very different than the valedictorian at a 500 student class. So I think that with time and the changes in schooling and the way you know that we're trying to challenge students and get them to pursue passions is um, that that's become an unwieldy and inaccurate measure to have that. Um, we talked about this two years ago when it came up and it's the story that really stands out to me is the a few years back at um, Severna Park High School there were two students who were tied the whole way and they were both outstanding musicians and senior year, I mean, they're all state musicians, and senior year, one chose to drop orchestra and take another AP class so that they would get the extra bump and ahead of their counterpart who stayed with her passion of taking music. And I hear that and I'm like, that is, that saddens me because this was something they had pursued for years and they made a choice not based on their love and, and, and the well-roundedness of, of their person, but just to get a grade point. And I hate to see that. I want our kids to feel like they can explore new and different things. And still, they and doing that, they can still graduate summa or magna or cum laude. And it's kind of, I loved, at every school I went to, there were dozens of the different Latin honors kids. And in fact, we asked ourselves that question, would we see more? meet the standard if they set it for themselves, cum laude, magna cum laude, summa cum laude. And Jason ran a few numbers on those. Yeah, uh, really exciting. Um, so when we set out with the cum laude system, the goal at the time was to recognize a, approximately the top 20% of a graduating class. Um, we project this year that we'll actually surpass um, 25, in fact, closer to 26% of the graduating class based on projected numbers of uh, class ranking as of January. Um, so we're very, very excited about that. All of them are going up. Just for instance, two years ago, we recognized 411 students for cum laude. We are anticipating 571. <laughs> we recognized two years ago for magna cum laude, 386 students. We anticipate 537 this year. And for summa cum laude, uh, which is the highest honors, which is a weighted uh, GPA of 4.3 or higher, pretty exclusive territory. Uh, two years ago, we recognized 287 students and we are anticipating um, honoring 406 students this year. So we have students pursuing excellence um, with our 
recognition system. It's, so it's really exciting. They're pursuing a standard Correct. that's not a competition against Correct. others, but saying for my personal goal, if I receive 4.4, 4.0, then I earn this. So they're working toward their own personal goal rather than going in a, in a competition mode against their classmates and having that. That's excellent information. Thank you. And to understand, is, and thank you for that great data, that it is a grade band. So not only is it now a competition not um, against us, but against the standard, but because it's you can gain access to that recognition through a grade band, you don't have to then give up the music. Right? Your senior year, I've got this passion, I still want to play in the band or the orchestra, and I can still make that grade band by not having to have that course, whatever that might be. And that's a way of sort of connecting what you were saying with the data. Mr. Grannon? Um, thank you for that. And of course, all of those good things are happening now under the current system where we have valedictorian and salutatorian. So more people are being honored. That's why the majority of the board voted overwhelmingly to uh, incorporate Latin honors. We're seeing these good results um, with valedictorian and salutatorian still being maintained. A couple of reactions to some other points. <clears throat> to Ms. Uray's point about it being disheartening to see that you're number 45 out of a class of 500, I mean, that, that's a pretty good number, but all that's being discussed, these are all just little gradations, is that student's still going to see that they're in the top 9%. So you're just taking it and you're softening it to a single digit decile. They're still going to see. So if any student's disappointed by being number 45 out of a class of 500, they're going to be just as disappointed to see that they're in the top 9%. And of course, they can compete and try to become in the top 8%. So I see what you all are trying to do by softening that a little bit. So it's literally not the, you know, one person racing against one other person, but softening it more into cohorts, as you described. That would eliminate the story that uh, Ms. Hummer talked about, about the two people being tied for the exact one spot, because they'd already be in the top 1%. However, if a student's in the top 2%, they might make that same choice. We obviously can't eliminate all competition in an academic setting. All of that being said, all of these benefits would still be achieved if you published this uh, single-digit uh, decile ranking to the top 9, 8, 7, whatever it is, percent. But then at graduation, in a serendipitous way, two people found out. One is valedictorian and one is salutatorian. It would get rid of, it would have all of the benefits that you're discussing while still maintaining those traditional honors. And I think with that, uh, I'd like to call the question. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna take the last two comments. Ms. Uh, Ms. Antoine. So I, I, I heard the, the concerns and the stories and I, I still stand on, we need to, also motivate these students to do even better, especially in, in a ranking. And even with the Latin system, there it will be some ranking there. Even when you get to graduation, if somebody has one more, um, one, something extra around their neck compared to someone else, it's going to be there. I, I am not I'm probably missing the fullness of the mental health side, and I'm thinking with the review, some of the public comments that, is, that are coming back will help that. But at this moment in time, I just do not see enough information here to change what we did two years ago. Thank you. Ms. Ellis. Uh, yes, finally, uh, I, I did, since we are going into a public comment period, I, I did want to speak to, um, because several um, people have reached out to me, some um, supporting uh, this change, but some concerned. And I have heard that phrase used a few times, everyone gets a trophy. And I really, really want to take exception to that because our students who earn summa cum laude, they have worked really hard for that. And that is a high honor. And if it's good enough for our colleges and universities, I don't know why we would be talking. Um, why would we, we would be talking about our students that way. It's um, any of the cum laude honors, it's an achievement. And um, so I, I think it's unfortunate for, um, for that phrase to be used for our students who are, who are <coughs> genuinely earning those honors. Um, and while it's not realistic 
that um, and we will never get to a point where every single student is summa cum laude. But the fact that that's possible, that 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 the math does not prevent that from happening, um, that puts the onus on the students to work for that. Um, so I, and uh, finally, I I don't I don't think um, students finding out just serendipitously uh, at the end whether they've uh, earned that um, valedictorian or saluted. Torian will remove that extreme competition that we have now because then students will continue. There will continue to be students who try to be perfect in what they think um, is considered perfect um, to, to get that number one spot. In other words, we will, I, I don't think we will have accomplished anything by maintaining that. Mr. Lodd? Could the chair please restate what the question is? Uh, are you oh. talking about the motion? Yes, please. Mr. Grandin, do you want to repeat your motion? Yeah, the, the, second, the second motion is to restore the last sentence. Um, that says uh, high school shall annually designate a graduating valedictorian and salutatorian. And again, just to recap and explain it, if we're maintaining the single percentage decile, what Ms. Ellis was just referring to, for example, that student is already going to know that they're in the top 1%. For them, do you think they're really going to relax and say, I'm comfortably in the top 1%, I don't have to worry about sliding into 2%? So if we're maintaining these percentages, we're effectively maintaining the rank, but just in these cohorts. So we're not going to get rid of any sense of personal competition as long as we have these percentages. Ms. Ortiz? I just um, want to point out, so if this motion moves forward, removing the last sentence, which is struck in what you have before you, there would really be nothing to move forward for public comment because it just retains what we currently have right now. So I have a question, actually, before we vote, um, Mr. Grannon. So essentially, you're saying that you don't, are you saying that you necessarily don't care about the ranking of the students, you just want the ceremony of Valsal at graduations? Well, it's not just that I want that. It's that that was the overwhelming view of the board two years ago, and that was the overwhelming uh, bent of the public comments that came in. I understand that there's different viewpoints. I'm trying to accommodate the viewpoint that's being expressed really by you to eliminate the class rank. I guess I'm leaving aside the fact that obviously a majority of the board endorsed this just two years ago, and in effect we're kind of be pulling out the rug from a lot of students that obviously thought that this was already in place. In any event, I, 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 am, I am saying that we should maintain, as I think a majority of the county did in their public <laughs> comments, that we should maintain valedictorian, salutatorian, and I think I'm trying to do it in a thoughtful way that accomplishes something that you've suggested, that this is like unnecessary personal competition between you know, one, pers one student and another student. If both of those students, now let's get in the nitty gritty, if both of those students know that they're in the top 1%, they don't know that they're not going to fall to 2%. Again, they're going to keep competing to stay in the top 1%, but they're not necessarily going to have any personal animosity about, well, this person's number one. They won't necessarily know. It'll be four or five or six or maybe even seven students in some larger schools that are in the top 1%. And then upon graduation, two of them will find out, hey, in addition to being in the top 1%, in addition to being summa cum laude, one of us is valedictorian and one of us is salutatorian. So I think it accomplishes a lot of what you're trying to, to, uh, to remedy, but at the same time maintaining something that a majority of the board voted on just two years ago in response to a lot of public comment. If, if I could. Yeah, Dr. Um, Alana. Uh, that, um, uh, Mr. Grant, I just want to clarify a couple things that you said um, for the board and for the public watching. Uh, one, you mentioned that, um, uh, and rightfully so, not wanting to pull the rug out from underneath students. The way this is proposed, this would not um, include any students that are in the current high school pipeline. Uh, I think it was written by the and proposed by the um, yes. policy committee yes. to begin with those ninth graders in the 2021 2022 20, school year mm -hmm. um, at, at the policy committee. It doesn't, it doesn't, Secondly, it doesn't the other part, it, it says front. it at the top of the. On the very front page. 
in red. Um, and then the other was to say um, that it was in the overwhelming majority of the board two years ago supported where we currently are. Um, again, that was, or not again, that was a board two years ago very different than the current board. And I think that's one of the reasons the policy committee wanted to move forward with different thinking of a different board. And it was certainly not overwhelming. I think if I, if I remember, it was a pretty close vote among the board about whether we should move forward or not at was, that it was, time. It was 6-3, Dr. Olato. It was 6-3. Okay. Are you finished, Mr. Grannon, with your light? Thank you. Yeah, okay. did you did you just recognize Dr. Alato when he spoke, by the way? Yes, I did. did. Okay. Mr. Uh, Ms. Corkadell? So we're finishing uh, board I, d I have just a quick clarification. So it, if is Mr. Grannon's proposal um, as it relates um, almost sounds like more procedural in other words that would be like the language wouldn't necessarily have to change it would be how it the information would be disseminated is what mr. Grannon is proposing I'm, I'm trying to get a clarification on the motion here that what we're proposing is that the vowel cell not be eliminated but simply honored so that the the person who landed at the top on graduation day gets to recognize so it would sounds like it would be more of a regulatory suggestion and wouldn't necessarily be embedded in policy or um, I, it, in that case yes, Dr. Um, I, I'm trying to sure. get an understanding yep. here because I, I, I'm here in both sides I haven't made up my mind yet but yes, definitely understanding to make sure that this is is it policy or regulation of how the information is disseminated. Yes, I, am. I think you're bringing up two, uh, you're, you're folding in two important pieces. If I understand Mr. Grannon's motion is in eliminating that sentence under section C number seven on page three of three, um, he is, uh, we would not be doing away with the vowel and sal recognition that the board in policy wants that to occur. The second part of that is in answering your question is then it would fall to regulatory language as to how we would do that. Right. We would then have to sit down with staff. We would then have to, right, so how would we designate that it is done? High school um, shall annually designate a graduating valedictorian and salutatorian. We would then, that would become regula in regulatory language. The board would be spelling out that they want it to occur. They want those, th those students identified. We would then have in regulatory language how that would go forward. So that means that the restore restoration of it should probably then include maybe an additional phrase or sentence to ensure the to ensure it or would that just occur uh, as a recommend shall. yeah shall. yeah shall occur shall. yeah shall. Uh, it is that what it, it, if we went with the understanding if the the under the new understanding of this is to modify it that what Ms. Urea is saying that her goal and accomplishment but meeting the other needs and concerns would be that on graduation day we would say who landed on the top um, not uncommon in sports and other things to occur um, but that sounds like that would be regulatory would that be something that would need to be spelled out or an understanding of moving forward if we if we remove this from the table of, of modification. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that I completely understand, yeah, but other, if I, if yeah. what I, what I believe the board is, is wrestling with now or, or what's been proposed in, in re, in re, in stating valedictorian salutatorian, which, if, if that's the direction the board wants to go in policy, that is what we will support. Um, what I'm not hearing, though, while if that is supported by the board, I'm not hearing necessarily support for continued use of class rank as a published measure, meaning, and that's still in regulatory language, and we would look to still eliminate that as a published measure to meet what I believe is what Mr. Grannon is um, the, the, the spirit of what he is trying, what he is proposing here, is that there will still be the recognition of valedictorian and salutatorian, but the class, but 
but publishing the class rank along the way doesn't necessarily have to occur in order to achieve that. Yeah, kind of like at the end of the sports game is when you assign the MVP, not during the game. And no one's necessarily going to be that, but uh, of course there's one or two wishing they are from the beginning of the game. But it's not until the end of the game that the MVP is identified, but we recognize the importance and value of saying you worked hard and you did land number one. To go your life not knowing that, I think, would be a little bit of disadvantage. So it is Mr. Grannon's amendment would allow that opportunity, but that would be in a regulatory uh, purview, which is your discretion. Correct. Correct. OK. Correct. Thank you very much. Yes, and also, Ms. Corkadell, just to, I think, answer as well, because um, remember in the policy committee, we discussed this and then um, Ms. Ortiz said if this does pass, we, she would then bring the regulation forward with what Dr. Lotto, or Dr. Alato is saying with the whole uh, regulations of how that would proceed. Correct. Um, mm -hmm. But I believe the removal of this language would, per, would limit their ability to say, hey, by the way, at the end of the year, here's who landed on top after their four years. And that's where I believe why the language had to, if the removal of that was removal of it, it I, I'm not recalling the whole conversation we had in committee. I don't want to redress it um, here in the public, but um, that, that's where, I, that's what I'm asking about is if we go one to the other, if that is allowed, recognizing that at least a couple members of the board may have an interest in that. I'm just trying to clarify. Okay, Ms. Hummer. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, I, I think in the two years since we've done this, there's been a lot of changes. We're seeing more and more schools that aren't doing class rank or Val Sal, but also we've seen a very great increase in concern about student mental health. My preference would be that we make no changes to this proposed policy until it has gone out for 30 days of public comment and we hear back from the community as they want and then at second reading if we're hearing overwhelmingly and we believe it's the will to maintain Valsal that we could do that then or we could go the other way but just leave it as is written now and then wait for the 30 days comment period and have come back and then we still have the opportunity to amend at that time. Ms. Antwine. One, what I'm hearing right now, I'm misunderstanding because if I am at that number one spot in my mind for four years and I don't get it, then there's a whole nother issue right there. But you wouldn't know until... I would know because I'm in the classroom with, with Pete and Susie or whatever. I know how hard I'm working. And then the announcement comes, graduation day or whatever, forgive me, and my name isn't announced, that too will cause a serious mental health um, issue. However, I, I agree with Ms. Hummer that we should put it back out there, but I, I, I'm understanding the status quo is not the amendment that we're recommending, but as the as is, that, that was in 2016-2017, is that correct? That is the motion. Oh, okay, so mm -hmm. I, I would be, could we not push it forward without the deletion to see and still get the, the public comment? Mm -mm. No. So no, because we wouldn't be making any amendments. So the, um, in accordance with your policy setting policy, once you make proposed revisions, amendments, updates um, to the policy, then that would be posted for public comment for 30 days. And as Ms. Hummer stated, you can certainly come back on second reading after you've received the public comment, you can come back on third reading and, you know, and amend it or decide, mm -hmm. either amend it or just decide to vote down, you know, what's been presented or, or mm -hmm. provide a different um, proposal so you're not prohibited from doing something differently on second and third reading so, so then I, I would request of the board that that we not talk as though this is the status quo because it's actually an amendment to the current policy and then the motion on the table right now is to just leave it alone and not send it out based on what I'm hearing and so we'll take a vote on to whether or not to send it out with the, the amendment or without it I, or let it stand as is. That that is our vote. 
Correct. If you so we have two different votes to, to do? Or so it would just be on? one vote on Mr. Grannon's motion that he's yes. presented. And so to, depending on how that vote goes. <laughs> his motion isn't to not move it publicly, but essentially if his motion passes, there would be nothing to put forth to the public. Right, because he because his it motion was, basically just, is saying leave it alone yes. and, and keep it as is. Okay, Correct. got it. Understood. Thank you. Ms. Schallheim. I, the question was called quite some time ago, and my understanding of that procedure is that when the question is called, the, the discussion stops. Am I wrong? Yes. So, like, can we move on? Okay. Um, I was trying to finish board comments. Is when you call the question, does that cease board discussion? So we didn't vote on calling the question. All right. Thank you. Mr. Lodd. I'm just trying to remember what I wanted to say. Uh, I, I believe what Ms. Hummer's suggestion is a valid way to go at this point. I understand Mr. Grannon's uh, motion to change what's in front of us, but at the same time, we can do that after the second read, after the public has commented. And I would also request that staff come back with some more investigative research about you know what is going on rather than having well we hear that you know Prince George is doing this Fairfax is doing that I'd like to hear for a matter of fact you know, how do they do that if it has Mr. Grannon says you serendipitously know you're the valedictorian I'm sure that's written out a little more a little better somewhere so we can figure out how that would occur so we at least have that understanding but I believe we can proceed regardless where we go with Mr. Ms. Hummer's idea, and we just put it out to public comment, <coughs> and we go into the real nitty gritty of it after the public has commented, so we find out are those concerns still there, Mr. Grant, and as you expressed from two years ago, I'd be interested to know that. Thank you. Mr. Grant? I guess the last thing I'll say about this in terms of um, the comment uh, that restoring the sentence means that there would be no, nothing to take forward. I think the reason for that is because the objective of this proposal is to eliminate valedictorian and salutatorian. All the other stuff that we've been talking about today could have been easily accomplished by Dr. Olato. Nothing is in this policy that says anything about giving a specific number of rank. You guys could have done the percentile thing in the last two years. You could have done all that stuff, but you didn't do that. You could have eliminated this rank issue in this excessive competition for to be a specific number and kept valedictorian salutatorian but you didn't do any of that there's nothing in here that says anything about percentiles or any that's all a matter of implementation and regulation all of that could have been accomplished so the reason that my motion goes to that sentence is because the objective of this proposal is to kill valedictorian and salutatorian something that the board just approved 6-3 <laughs> after a lot of public comment only two years ago i understand what you're saying mr live about Okay, well, what's the harm? Let's send it forward. I mean, if we're going to be honest about these things, ordinary members of the public are not focused every day on uh, the, the, the business of the Board of Education. To have all of the public comment that came through, and I know you, you're taking me at my word, I've never seen as much public comment on any issue, any issue bar none, since I've been sitting up here as came in on that. And to say to the public just two years later, this was just voted on, we just took all of your comments into account after three readings, after extensive debate, and now we're going to do this again. I do think that's very confusing to the public to say, okay, well, we want all those people that wrote in, you know, two years ago to do all that again. That's a lot to ask of people after only two years have passed. So I guess what I would say is in, in respect for a very recent board action and 6-3, I don't know, if that's not overwhelming, it, it, it certainly – pretty comfortable majority to say, okay, well, not, we're not going to come forward again, N not to have it come, by the way, as a staff recommendation, but to have it come through a policy committee without getting, you know, full board input is, 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 is it, 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 that's not the best way for us to conduct our business. Mm -hmm. After a majority of the board just decided this for a very small minority of the board to be able to suggest to the public this is all going to be upended again, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And again, you all could do this thing with going to the percentiles right now. You could have done it two years ago. You could do it tomorrow. 
That's within your implementation purview. All of that could have been accomplished, and I don't know why you didn't do that if it was such a concern. Man. So, Dr. Mr. Grant, I understand that within the regulatory language, um, it talks very specifically about how you get to a vowel and a sal. There are very specific language about the, uh, about the way the math that is used at which point in the year to arrive at a vowel and sal. And so I, I, I can't, w we can't accomplish that if I were to eliminate class rank without eliminating Val Sal, I'd have no way of getting to Val Sal if I eliminated class rank. There is a correlation here. There is a direct connection. So while you say we could have, n no, no. Because if I get rid of the math that tries to figure out how to come up with a Val and Sal, then um, I can't figure out a Val and Sal. Ms. Ellis. Uh, I, I I understand the point about um, how much outcry there probably was two years ago, um, and so. Um, but having just run for office, I can tell you the number one issue I can have heard about, heard about all along the campaign trail, continue to hear about, is the mental health of our students. Sometimes, an issue is sort of boiling under the surface but not recognized and then it sort of explodes and and so i and i think this is nationwide right now but um more and more people are becoming um tuned in to the concern of the mental health of our students and so uh it i i don't think it's um out of place for us to revisit the issue at this time mr grannon I guess I, I'm going to pose this question to Dr. Lotto to explain the statement that you just made because as I understand it, um, the regulatory language is within your purview. That's not something that's in this policy. That's not something that we voted on. And so, for example, the very thing that we're discussing now of serendipitously saying to someone upon graduation, you happen to be valedictorian, you happen to be salutatorian, you could do that right now under the existing language. There's nothing that says in that regulatory language that you have to inform the students of the class rank, or if there is, then you could have changed that without the board's input. Everything that you're seeking to do or that is being proposed to be done could be done right now, except for you must designate a valedictorian salutatorian, because that's what the language says. So everything that we've been talking about here today as a potential compromise, to have, that, uh, have students serendipitously informed of that, after the fact, you could do all of that right now under the existing language because it doesn't say when, it just says you shall designate. All of that math in your regulations doesn't say that you have to give the specific number to students. It doesn't, doesn't say that. It says you have to calculate it. All that could be kept in, in a file the, sa the, the same way you keep the percentiles in a file. That's your choice. So I, I, don't th I don't think you can genuinely say that somehow your hands were tied and you had to maintain single digit uh, class ranks. That's not the case. You could have gone to a percentile publication before. Okay. So. Um, and that was a question. Dr. Lara, did you say sure. What, what was the question? The question is you made a statement. I just said something that was contrary to your statement. I want to okay. know what's inaccurate about what I said. I think it's important to understand that um, the board brought this forward, um, and I think it was very, on a very bold move on your vice president's part um, to bring this conversation um, back up, um, and there are a number of issues that revolve around it. Um, it is, and I'll stand again in regulatory language, that for us to achieve a val and a sal, we have to continue to um, maintain the class rank. And if that were to exist, then I'm certain that we would have families, I would have students that would want, expect to see their class rank on their transcripts. And that would be eliminated if we were to eliminate doing the math of the class rank and then just sort of keep it in the shadows 
until I think, as you are suggesting, keeping it in the shadows and then bringing it forward sort of at the last minute to say, by the way, before you walk across the stage, George, you are the valedictorian or you're the salutatorian. Those students, I think, if the valensal were to exist, they would want to know along the way. And in the current language, it allows for that. If I went to go ahead and eliminate that math and eliminate that possibility, with now, it's now just become serendipitous that it's, you're going to find out at the end, that's not the way we've conducted business. That's not the way I would recommend that we conduct business. That is your suggestion, and if that's the will of the board, we could move forward that, but that's not how we've conducted business. Students want to know. If there is going to be a valensal and I am in the running for the valensal, I'm going to want to know what the numbers are. And if I were to go back into regulatory language and eliminate the numbers, I wouldn't have that available to the students. How, could, how can you calculate the percentages to say top 1%, top 2%, top 3% if you don't do the math? You can't. The math is still going to get done. Correct. Thank you. That's all I'm saying. So the, the math that you're saying about bound you and kept you from doing this all this time is still going to get done. You're just not going to publish it. Which Understanding is that, that the percentages the is a different kind of math because we've had to go on the grade point averages. And so we had to spell out how we were going to select what the cutoffs were for salutatorian and uh, or, or for magna cum uh, loud or, or cum loud. We had to develop those and write those into regulatory language. That's a different kind of math than saying you are number one, two, three, and four based on your grade point average. We had to set cut points and establish that own life. So now we've got two kinds of math in our regulatory language, that that selects the honor system and that that selects the Val Sal. Ms. Ellis? So when a student is getting ready to walk across the stage, their college application acceptance process is done the scholarship process is pretty much done true so I, I'm not sure what what at that point the student is gaining from us maintaining the system okay no more board comments any public comment on mr. Grannon's motion seeing none um, Molly will you call the roll question or are to we voting on to call the question my bad you don't need to call the question now no. okay voting on mr. Granning's motion voting on mr. Granning's motion yes just to make sure I understand correctly <coughs> I, I'm, I'm voting nay which is voting against changing the proposed policies right so nay to mr. Yeah. Granning's question right what, what is the motion no and I Okay. The sentence. Yes. Restore the sentence. Restore the sentence. Restore the sentence. Nay. Mr. Granite. Aye. Ms. Corkadell. Is that a yay? No. That is a no. Ms. Hummer? Nay. Ms. Urea? Nay. Ms. Antoine? Aye. Ms. Shawheim? I think it should go to public comments so nay. I said I think it should go to public comment, so that's a nay for, for me. So that's a nay. Yeah. Mr. Lyd. Aye. Mr. Gillen is absent. Yep. So it's three, five, three in the positive, five in the negative, motion fails. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Do we have to still vote to move this forward? No, since um, it's just okay. first reading. Okay. Yes. So now moving on to other action items. Item 6.06, .06, which is the 2019 to 2020 Board of Education public session hearing and workshop dates. Um, and just for clarification, this is for specifically um, 
the Board of Education's calendar, not the actual school calendar. Is there any motion? Or someone needs to read recommendation. Um, I'll read it. I'll read it. Okay. It's because well, we just have to we we put it forth under okay. the amendment. Um, or no, you would read it, actually. I okay. Think you would read it. Um, so the Board of Education recommends the approval of the 2019-2020 Board of Education public session hearing and workshop dates. So moved. Second. Okay. Any amendments? Yeah, I have my light on. Yeah. Michelle Hunt? Yes, I have two amendments, actually. Um, the first is to move the October 16th date to the 23rd uh, in the evening. The second is just because daytime meetings are hard for people to get to. February is a hot month. We are passing budget. I move also that this is part of the one motion. One motion, okay. Yeah, so 20, October 23rd, nighttime meeting, February 5th, switch from a day to a nighttime meeting. That's my motion. Does anyone want to second me? Any second? Wait, okay. All right, so the, what? Wait. Can you please read your motion, Ms. Yes. Malheim, again? Yes. We, one is to move the October 16th date, because school is shut that day, and I think it puts people at a disadvantage, to, to, the, to October 23rd. That's the first one. The <laughs> second one is to be more accessible to the public in the month that we do the budget and not have a daytime meeting that month and just have two night two nighttime meetings. All right, we can split it out, fine. Let's do the October one first. So, so are you proposing the first motion the to The first be motion of two is to move the one from the 16th to the 23rd of October. I will okay. second I, that one. Dr. Alano. If I just want to clarify because the statement was made, Michelleheim, that school is closed on that day. School would be open for high school students. For high school, my on bad. On the 16th, am but I? Close right. for elementary and middle. Be close for elementary and middle, but open for high school Great. students yes. and staffs. Okay. Right? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, was there a second? There yes. was. Okay. Um, Ms. Corkadel? No. You don't want your like Okay. Okay. Molly, will you call the roll on Ms. Schalheim's amendment? Moving the October meeting. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Is there any other public comment on this? One in the public. Okay. Molly, will Moving we call the October now? meeting to October 20th. Yes. Both evening, evening. Miss mm -hmm. Ellis? Aye. Wait, 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 wait. wait. It's they, for October 23rd. Just the October 23rd. It's not, both of them would be two evening meetings, would it? No. no. Just shifting it. Just moving it down one week. It was, it's now. A morning meeting to the 23rd, but it's still a morning session. No, it's an after, because look, we have, the, we have the first meeting there, yeah? So that's, a, that's the AM meeting, that's the PM meeting, but I want to move from here to here. The 16th is the evening meeting and you want to move it to the 23rd. Yes, yes ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Mr. Grennan? Aye. Ms. Corkido? Aye. Ms. Hummer? Aye. Uh, Ms. Urea? Aye. Ms. Antoine? Aye. Ms. Schollheim? Aye. Mr. Leib? Aye. Okay, Mr. Gillen is absent. Eight. Zero amendment passes. Okay. Any other board comments? Okay. Do you want? Would you like the motion for a second amendment? Yeah. Do I hear a second? I'll second for discussion. Okay. Ms. Corkadel? Thank you, Ms. Schalheim. I, I appreciate that optic. However, I'm just going to point out that there's a benefit to our daytime meetings for those who work in the evenings, that we have a vulnerable population that sometimes does need to rely on our daytime. And the second point I will make is that we already have public hearings on the budget. So in February, we are not hearing testimony specific to the budget because of our public hearing, just as we have done in our redistricting and do each and every single year. Um, so I will be a no on this um, for those two points, um, specifically for 
are vulnerable and those who just work may may not be vulnerable but they do shift work and we do have a significant population who appreciates our having one and one miss Ellis uh, yeah I was going to mention the the budget hearings as well those are two evening opportunities um, and then um, additionally we have potentially an additional evening that month so um, right no I mean as in addition to our regular evening meeting that month we may uh, be here the following evening and so um, in consideration for the staff that um, work into the evening for that purpose I, I'm, I'm not sure I, I see the benefit okay I'll withdraw my motion okay miss Antoine so it was for well, let's go back to February it was my understanding that we were adding to the two meetings we already have to allow not public comment but to allow discussions on any amendments is that still the case yeah. and that would and so that would be on the 20th of February and that's going to happen in the evening right okay so thank you for that I would also say that we need to to review um, <coughs> Our, our professional development days and, and assess those against the, the current calendar as well. This, this particular year, um, I understood that some of the some of the public didn't didn't get to testify, as well as uh, some of the staff didn't get to attend their PD days. So for right now, um, based on what I can see here, that there is no conflict. But if there is, I would request that we we be. Um, open to amending this calendar miss Corkadell I call the vote okay there's no more comments. there's no more board comments so yeah yeah we have to vote on them okay um, any other board comments seeing none any public comment okay as amended um, with miss Shalheim's amendment to move the October 16th to the 23rd um, miss Connolly will you please call the roll Ms. Ellis? Aye. Mr. Granin? Aye. Ms. Corkadell? Aye. Ms. Hummer? Aye. Ms. Urea? Aye. Ms. Antoine? Aye. Ms. Schalheim? Aye. Mr. Live? Aye. Mr. Gillen is absent. 8 0. Motion passes as amended. Okay, now moving on to item 7 review items. Um, this is just a review item, so any questions? Um, any public comment? Okay. Seeing none, um, the next general board meeting will be on Wednesday, April 17th, 2019 at 7 p.m. The next policy committee will be Wednesday, April 10th, um, 2019 at 1 p.m. as well. And now, Ms. Antoine, will you motion to adjourn? Madam Vice President, I move that the board go into closed session to do the following conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations Second. all the eyes uh, awesome I was an unorganized person that was constantly losing all my papers. And now I'm an organized good student. I also used to be afraid of public speaking, but now I'm giving this speech. Nina Greger from Chesapeake High School also shared her story. Growing up is a difficult task for everybody. During the first 18 years of a person's life, one hits many milestones. 10 years old, you hit the double digits. 13 years old, you become a teenager. 16 years old, you get your license, if you pass. <laughs> 17 years old, you can legally watch r movies. And finally, 18 years old, you officially become an adult. I think once you become a quote-unquote adult, you're expected to know what career you'll pursue and how you want to spend the rest of your life. That's a lot of pressure. 
especially if you have parents that didn't go to college and are unable to guide you through the application process. When I was three years old, my parents divorced. I grew up going between two houses while my parents fought for custody. It was a scary and confusing time, especially because I was so young and naive. This experience has taught me to have morals, strong morals, and go above and beyond people's standards because I can and will achieve great things in life, and I refuse to let negative situations bring